Blackout. Well, this is your, your bag, uh, isn't it? You ready for me to open my mouth? Yeah, sir. Sure, well, sir. We, let's do this. Let's have a little, let's have some applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> my friend and yours, Aaron Stewart. Hello, hello, everybody. It's your boy, Ernest Stewart, a.k.a. True Wendigo. And uh, right across from me, we've got the sultry and the sexy Irish bastard. Patty, how are we doing today? I was doing great till you said that, man. You know? Thanks a lot. Thanks yeah, a lot. You gave it to I me. I know you mean well. God Enjoy bless you. Enjoy it. Uh, and our boy, Samson, over here in the corner. How are we doing, Samson? I'm pretty good. No nickname for me, I guess. You know, well, no. the great white hope. Um, and with us, this is our super special guest this evening, Representative John Soka. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. Thanks. So this is actually going to be a special one for us. Um, outside the fact that this is going to be our first real official aired one, uh, we've had ones we have before, but this one is definitely going to go down in the history books to uh, set us up so people don't think we're just complete jokes. We're actually going to have some serious <laughs> conversations. There we go. Uh, for once, <laughs> uh, other than just the jokes. Um, so... Uh, I'm going to let Patty take it from here because Patty likes to get to know people. Okay. Well, and he's, sounds good. He's, you, he's really good at handling that. You have to get to know people. You can't just dive right in. When I first came to this country, John, within a couple of days of walking around Fable, ran into a bar, which has ironically become my bar, Nashville Station, it used to be called. And I had a sign in the window and it said, Free Shag Lessons. So in my mind, I was thinking, these Americans just waste no time, do they? <laughs> but uh, no, no. In the interest of uh, the quorum and good, like a good Catholic boy that I am. Yeah, we wanted to ask, first of all, I mean, politics. We're going to get into some politics here, which I'm sure some people at home will be, you know, enjoying themselves watching. But, others will, but I want to ask you about yourself, your military your background, you know right. what I mean? And why did you join the military? And you were an officer in the military. I was an officer. I actually went to, to West Point, graduated from West Point. Wow, so um, was your career. I'm not originally from North Carolina. Of course, if you look at my name, there's not many native names in North Carolina that begin SZ. So no. uh, I'm from a uh, suburb in Cleveland, Ohio, where my grandparents immigrated to. They settled down there. Went to West Point. Um, I grew up in a time when all my uncles uh, were World War II vets and told me great stories of that. And yeah. uh, it, it was one of those things that got in my blood, and I decided I wanted to be in the Army. And I joined, well, I applied for West Point at a very unpopular time in our nation's history, right near the end of the Vietnam era. Um, mm. Got there, graduated, spent 20 plus years in the Army. I'm a Airborne Ranger qualified infantry guy. Uh, wow. That's always what I wanted to be, two feet firmly on the ground. Right. I am airborne, so uh, I couldn't wait to get out of the plane and back on the ground. <laughs> right, absolutely. Well, so if there's one organization that I have run into in my time in the United States that's political, is that is the army, the military. When I, you know, with the uh, the colonel that we, uh, I came here with Jimmy and Justin, two other Irish mm -hmm. guys in 1987, and we all live with different families. The family that Justin lived with was the seven group. Special Forces Commander, Colonel Jacobi, who treated us like all the parents did, really, that we were living like, like their own children. He was just great, him and his wife. But uh, so we got a real um, kind of education about the military. We'd never seen even a gun before. You know what I mean? Coming from Ireland. You know, mm. not really. So it was, it was interesting. But, uh, but he was in his mid-40s, and he was, a, he was a commander. And I remember the casual conversation we were asking around, around the dinner table, and it was uh, somebody said that you know he would never make he would never become a general because more than likely because he had pissed off somebody along the way uh, <laughs> that you know and here's and here's a, a Vietnam hero a hero American hero like you and uh, he'd half a stomach and one kidney from Vietnam just you know and his wife would tell stories about when they were dating and she was waiting for him and he came back all messed up with lost part of his body. And she thought that you know, he's he's but at least he survived, and he just goes back again, goes back again, and leaves her. You know, I mean, just um, I, I've never met anyone like that. You know, but anyway, he's an amazing man. But he treated us like ordinary. He treated us like his kids, man. He was fine. He let us have a beer with him. It was great. He, un he understood where we were from, and that it wasn't a big deal. If we're sitting there with him, the mm -hmm. culture we we're coming from. But he seemed like the pair. Why wouldn't the guy like this be leading? You know, he's. Of course he's a leader. Of course he's a colonel, you know. But he'd never be a general because of some some guy that he did didn't like him ten years before. 
it's a strange organization. How did you deal with the politics? It, it, in it is a strange organization. Um, I was never a general. I retired as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, you Just like life, uh, whether it's the Army, whether it's the corporate world, you have to make up your mind at some point in time, are you going to be yourself or are you going to conform to somebody else's idea of what they want you to be? Me, for better or for worse, if somebody asked me my opinion, I always gave my, my opinion. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we were on exercise or something the general would come by and say, well, Captain Soka, Major Soka, Lieutenant Colonel Soka, or Colonel Soka, what, what do you think about that? And I'd tell him, and I would just see my other commanders uh, behind me cringe. But, but I'm not going to tell them what they want to hear. I'm going to tell them what my opinion is. And if they're big boys, they'll accept that, big boys and girls. And if they're not, they can't. So I think what happens a lot of times in life is that as you're trying to do your job and sometimes maybe be promoted into something, you turn yourself into somebody that you're not. And I never did that for whatever reason. Sorry, my cell phone. <laughs> I apologize. That's fine. <laughs> Forgot to turn the bloody thing off. Um, uh, you know, one more thing before I ask you, are we, are we go into politics, I'll ask, uh, turn it over to the lads, is that obviously, you know, you did well, you know, so you're able to, you know, you were able to you be yourself and not have to sell your soul or your principles, you know what I mean, to get to get ahead, you know. But it's, it, it again, it, the organization, it seems to me, and it, it, that's not the only situation. There's been several others of me, men I was, people I was unfortunate enough to know who are gr amazing, decorated soldiers, but had a mistake, you know, made a mistake, whatever. They made, made a mistake. And, to, and they were done in the military. And, and it seemed to me like telling Michael Jordan, for instance, mm -hmm. if he misses curfew for a basketball game or something, you know, not only will he not play the game, but he'll never play the game again. Well, you know, the Army, like all the armed forces, there's a hierarchy there. And, and don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that every general isn't themselves because it's, it's one of those things that everybody in the Army, by and large, is pulling the oars in the same direction uh, for the organization because that's how you survive in the Army and that's what you're trained to do. So just because somebody's a four-star general doesn't mean that they compromise themselves. But there's... Just well, like anywhere in the world. Course, I, I, you know? I, 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 so, I understand that. I, I guess I was more getting to get into why they why they kind of penalize people that like they need. We need those guys. You can, you, you, you're kicking them out or you're keeping them down. We need this guy. You know what I mean? That's, that's all. I'm not saying that people who get right. to be general. Well, I, was, somehow, I was clarifying my own comments, really, because right, I didn't right. want to make it seem like I'm something special and the generals aren't because that's not. Intent, oh sure, I understand. You, you know, there's there's rules and there's uh, some rules that are kind of open hand rules that you can eh, you can break the rule and it doesn't really matter. And there's other rules like closed hand rules like DWI. Yeah. If you're in the army and you're going to get a DWI, you're going to be out, and you know that. Yeah. So don't do I'll it. Get a and if you make that big of a mistake, well, then man up and take the consequences. Yeah. Um, so it it depends on what the Sometimes the punishment is. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess sometimes the punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime. It's a strange organization. Yeah. I have the deepest respect for the military. Anyone that knows me knows that. I just find the, the way they run it a little weird. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's okay. Again, thank you for being part of this. I will turn it over to Ernest. This is his baby political blackout. I love the concept and uh, I'm interested in, in hearing a little bit more about the political and cultural events and your reaction to them at some point i would like to like to ask you about the abc sure. commission and how the abc laws work and we'll talk a little about the pandemic i'm sure Ernest. okay all right so you know before i actually want to jump into that i i do have to have a question how did the transition from the military how do you go from military to politics it wasn't overnight uh, military to civilian was a big enough change for me i had to adapt to that because I graduated from high school, went right to West Point Military Academy, and then was commissioned and served in the Army. So coming out of the Army, retiring, I'd never truly been a civilian since I was in high school. Um, I immediately assumed that the civilian society worked exactly like the Army was, that people didn't lie, they didn't cheat, they didn't steal, that, that if you could, if somebody said something, you could take them at their word. And uh, yeah, I, I, you're laughing. I've, I'm, I'm just foolish. telling you. So it's, 
<laughs> there's a path to politics here somewhere. Wow, but, the swamp. But, huh? uh, yeah, well, I, that's how I came out, and through a couple experiences working for uh, one or two folks here in town, I found out that uh, the civilian world was not like the army. So it uh, nobody got hurt, nobody got killed, but it kind of opened up my eyes to the differences in the civilian world as opposed to the army, where literally. You don't lie because if you lie on the battlefield, somebody's likely to get yeah. killed, and the consequences are fatal. So it's not like you lose money or you get fired or anything else. So um, that was a change I had to adapt to. Um, I ended up starting my own company, uh, had my own mortgage company for, in the end, it was about 13 years. And near the end of the time that I owned it, I had a very unsatisfactory interchange with a, a deputy commissioner of banks. I won't name his name because he's still alive. And, Screwing things up in Washington D.C. now, I think. Um, it's but, your, is that your business? That's your uh, industry's ABC officer, is it? Or um, possibly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So. <laughs> Those are the enforcers. They yeah, have their. Okay. They have your license in their hands. They and certainly they can do. Either let you keep it. That's the only way. thing they have in their hands. That's all right. No. But uh, <laughs> anyway, he. Long story short, we had a meeting up in Raleigh in the uh, conference room there, and he was rude, arrogant. Um, I, I mean, to a point where he was putting his finger in my face, which I didn't do anything to deserve that, calling me all kind of different names and things. And it's like, I'm only up here to advocate for a change in the law, and you're doing this. And I was thinking to me, and his closing argument was when he literally got out of his chair, bent over the table, had his bony little finger about this far from my nose. Remember, airborne ranger qualified infantry officer. I really wanted to break his finger off and put it somewhere for him, <laughs> but I, I didn't. I had a death grip on the table, and his closing argument was, we don't make the laws. We only write the rules, and if you don't like it, go talk to the legislature, and he, then he paused waiting for me to burst out of my chair and do something, but I got really calm. I thought, you know, if this is the way you treat me, who's a business owner and a taxpayer, uh, how do you treat other people who, who, who aren't? who aren't business owners. How, what do you do? So it was the arrogance of a petty bureaucrat that really made me angry. And I decided, you know what? Uh, if it's a legislature that writes the rules and controls your job, I'm going to do that. So that was really the motivating factor for me to uh, get into politics. And I did, and the first time I lost, and I did again, and I won in my fourth term right now. Good for you. Yeah. That's what leaders should be made of. Like, take the high road and do something about it. I don't want to smack him in the mouth myself. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't want to smack him in the mouth, but uh, I, I didn't. So. <laughs> it's all right. Good for you. So, personal question. Uh, uh -oh. More of uh, maybe a slightly philosophical take two, philosophical <laughs> one. Okay. Um, would you rather deal with war or deal with polit politicians? Yeah. Oh, man. That's a good question. Um, Where do you see the worst of people? Well, I, I, to be clear, uh, the um, I was never in a combat zone. I only deployed to Haiti when we invaded them in 1994. So I haven't right. seen the type of conflict, armed conflict, that a lot of uh, folks have seen since that time. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> it is a good question. Um, in politics... You hope for the best. I'm basically an optimist. The glass is always half full, just like this glass. It's half full, though. Even though I've had a couple sips of it, it's half full. Um, of non-alcoholic beer. Of non-alcoholic beer. That's correct. Um, if you, but you have to be aware that people will not always tell the truth and be honest in politics. So, the, you know, in life, the only thing you really have is your reputation and your honor. So if you've, fall down and, and you lose your honor and you compromise yourself and you start lying to get ahead personally or lying to get ahead for your party, as far as I'm concerned, you're done. And there are politicians I know up in Raleigh who are like that, and I just don't really deal with them. There's lobbyists like that. I don't deal with them because that's the only thing a person has in their life is their own personal integrity. Whether I win or lose the election really doesn't matter. I mean, am I going to be true to myself and you yes. know, what, what God expects of me? You got this. Yeah, so I'm going to do that. Amen to that, my friend. So you can set yourself up for big disappointments uh, if you don't live in the real world and not acknowledge that everybody doesn't believe what I just said. <laughs> so you, you have to, the way I do it is I treat everybody else like they're like me. They're going to be honest and tell the truth and not stab me in the back and stuff until they prove otherwise. So there have been some disappointments and 
certain yeah. people. But, so what uh, do you mean you don't have to deal with these guys? You're up in that house. I've seen a p Tony showed me a friend of mine, Tony Rand, yeah. my dear friend, just passed, God rest his soul. Show a great picture in his office of everybody in the state legislator and all that. It's pretty cool. Like yeah. you, know, you deal with them. They're right sitting right next to you. And he had he had some choice words to describe you know the Republican <laughs> side of the oil. It started with a uh, word to start with a C. I can't say anyway, right? But uh, and I'm sure that the other side of the oil had similar words to describe the, you know whatever. I always thought that was the funniest thing. But um, you have to deal with these people. You do have to deal it, with them. It don't is, you? but like, you know the interesting you know thing is a slime is, ball, right? Huh? Even the though people, you know it's people, a people, slime ball, yeah, yeah. I, there are certain people who are slime balls and still have to deal with them. The really interesting thing is that we all know television yeah. news. They're looking for they're looking for that snippet where they can show conflict and they can get viewers. That's true. Ninety nine percent of the time, Republicans deal with Democrats, go to lunch with them, have a beer with them, you know, sit together in committees. And like, I'm not saying you don't get angry with somebody and say, you know, you're really stupid. No, you're stupid. You know, that kind of thing. But most of the time, um, you know where the other person's coming from. You know where you're coming from, and it's negotiation. You're trying to get the best deal you can, and whoever has the majority is most of the time going to get the best deal. But it doesn't mean you don't negotiate. Right. And it doesn't mean that you get rude and angry and things like that. What you see on TV, the overwhelming majority of the time, is people who stand up and are, are, are performing for the cameras. Hmm. They're going to stand up and they're going to perform for the cameras so they can get their sound bite on the news and then that helps them in their mind somehow. I don't, do, I, I don't talk that much on the floor of the house. I only talk when I have something that I think is important enough to talk about. Sure. Yeah, you know, there's a number of people up there. Um, <laughs> if you ever watch the House and the Senate, you'll see people get up and leave the chamber. It's it, it might be the call of nature. They might need water, but but there's a saying up there that in these big debates, budget debates, and all that kind of stuff, uh, that's everything's been said. It's just that everybody hasn't said it. <laughs> so you get a line of 20 people. They're going to say the same thing, and some people just get out of the chamber and it's like ah, I can't listen to this again. <laughs> no kidding, <laughs> no. Me either. I love that. I'm gonna get a T-shirt with that on the end of it. On the back of it you know, <laughs> everything's been said and everybody's said. Well, uh, you know, <clears throat> I think from the observing the the observational standpoint of looking at what goes on, it would appear certainly nationally anyway. It would appear that the Republicans and the Democrats cannot agree on the color of what comes out of my arse. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's really um, it's very disconcerting, and it is. Uh, I'm, I don't have any children of my own, but I know a lot of young people, and I don't. I give them a hard time for those who don't vote. It drives me mad, you know. But but they're frustrated. They can't tell what the truth is. They can't tell, you know. You know, everyone seems like they're full of crap. You know what I mean? You try right. to talk. Look, this is what we got. You got to get involved. It's your duty to get involved. But it is difficult because it doesn't seem like they. They apparently in the old days that they'd go into a room. And they they negotiate and they come out with something good, you know, and say, "Come on, man, we got to do this," you know. And a good a good example of that would be the stimulus bill right now that's mm -hmm. getting held up. That they can't agree on. Say, I mean, I, there's people that, that that are in my employ that are struggling, man. You know what I mean? People have children and all that, and they can't agree to get something out to help those people. You know what I mean? That just to put food on the table. They like, said, so "Children are okay. Just get that done." You're talking about Washington. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't know how that translates to rally, but holy God, is you know it doesn't appear that they're friend, even friends. So it's interesting to hear you say that. Uh, and they may not be in, in D.C. I haven't served up there. I visited there and talked to folks, and uh, it is, I think, a little more partisan uh, than here. But we're not perfect either. I mean, we've got divided government. We have Democrat governor. We have Republican controlled House. Mm -hmm. Republican controlled Senate, and we don't have the two thirds majority to override a veto. So there's there's okay. some of that that goes on here too. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, it's it's how do you deal with that? Some people on um, both sides retreat to their partisan corners and just and that's where they are. Um, I, well, that's the thing. Par par I, I just try and get stuff done. But, you know? And I think that's really great. Again, I don't want to get too in, too in the weeds with it or take it over here. And it's like, I, I, I just wanted to ask about, like, I'm really interested in the, in the, like the humanity of people, you know what I mean, that, that are leading us. And, and, and to, sometimes you hear them speak and the media are even worse. 
that like they they totally ignore the elephant in the room or they like on purpose you know what i mean I'll i'm going to tell you how you can change it i'm going to tell you and everybody who listens to this how they can change it and i've told this to groups all across the state and you have to be involved in your government it's mm -hmm. not my government because i'm elected it's your government because you're a citizen you have Absolutely the right to vote right. if you don't vote frankly i don't want to hear you whine yes not not, not that anybody here's whining because i know you all vote my mom always said that but but if you don't, don't vote complain. then just shut up right so i if you, totally agree with that so man. that's <laughs> number one and number two is if you feel strongly about an issue contact your congressman your u.s senator your representative you know, well, whoever it is that you have an issue with contact them and uh, i'm going to tell you right now that there's a lot of organizations uh, national organizations that you get on their list and it's like, oh, contact your senator and they send you a form letter to send in. You know, and we had 500,000 people. Send it. Those are completely and utterly useless. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I get those, I just count how many it is. And it's like, well, they all say the same thing. The, that constituent doesn't have the energy to get on their own keyboard and type an individual email to me. Because I guarantee if I get an individual email, I'll, I'll answer it. I'll tell my staff how to answer it. Right. If I get a handwritten letter, from somebody, oh, buddy, I'll tell you what, th those are like gemstones. You know, I, I just found <laughs> wow. a diamond here. Somebody really cares, and I pick up the phone and call them back. Now, that might just be me, but I will tell you that a lot of folks are like that. Well, it's a dying art. Do you not find letter mm -hmm. writing is a dying art? Most people can't write a note. Even if you do it on a computer and print it out, right. that's still something special. I'm not talking about getting a form I, letter from an organization. I'm mean, putting your own thoughts into words. Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, that makes a difference to me. That's a great point, and I, I, I agree completely. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I beat the hell out of people, you know, for not for not plugging in. That's what the memorial wall we showed you in the bar today, all those people who died for your right, you know, yeah. to... Uh, the first thing I did, when as soon as I be, could become a citizen of the United States, I started the process, you know. And, uh, you know, it takes several years and a bit of money and all that's fine. And a bunch of running back and forth to Charlotte, you know, who at yeah. that time was the only, you had to go to Charlotte. Now I believe they have a, an office in uh, Raleigh, from what I understand. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, it was a real proud moment. And I, because I wanted to vote. I thought, yeah, I'm meeting these guys and guys and girls and families that are serving the country. And many of them pass, you know, never, mm -hmm. even if they come home, sometimes they're, damaged. you know, they're damaged. And, and like, you have to vote. Are you kidding me? You don't know about your own country? The details of the nation, who, what kind of country this is, how it's run, who runs it, you know, uh, and the, the history of the country. It should be something that, that uh, everybody knows. You know, and here in Fayetteville, where we are, if you look at the last municipal election, the voter turnout was, what, 19 percent? Oh, so and people were clapping about that. It's I mean, that, so that's ridiculous. Sad. And the voter turnout in this election, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not going to be 100 mm -hmm. percent. It's you know? so sad. It, it breaks my heart. Yeah. So the, uh, the, and the, there's a corollary to what I said, and is if you want to have the most impact on an elected official, go see him where they live. I'm not saying protest outside their house or do something else, but if people right. see me in a uh, you know, food line or Harris Teeter or the grocery store or whatever and say, hey, John, what about this? I'll stop and talk to them. You know? I mean, our North Carolina legislature is a citizen legislature, so we only spend a certain amount of time up there and there's time down here doing my regular day job you know trying to right. pay the bills so sure. uh talk to people where they are so um so you're on the house select committee for COVID 19. yep what's that like what's that? Uh, that was very good um the uh, i'm also on house leadership and mm -hmm. we got together when COVID came and uh, tim moore the speaker of the house we all talked about it and he said i'm going to set up this select committee because normal committees wouldn't cover it Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the normal committee structure, it, it just wasn't good enough. So we said, OK, we need about the same number of Republicans and Democrats. And we had co-chairs, you know, like two Republicans and Democrats. So it was completely bipartisan. That was probably the mm -hmm. most bipartisan group of committees I've ever served on. There was one for health. There was one for the economy or a, a couple other things. Everybody listened because we're all pulling in the, the oars in the same direction because we recognize that people in the state are in trouble. We need to do something. What do we do? I mean, none of us have ever lived through a pandemic. So we mm -hmm. kind of figured it out together, listened to the experts, talked to us, as expert as they are. And expert in a pandemic, uh, there's not many. And no. at, yeah. at the state That's and the federal true. level, there's a lot of theories about that experts have, but nobody's lived through it. So you have to take that into account when 
you're judging somebody on the policy. They come up with, oh, they should have done this, should have done that. Yeah, well, I should have been a millionaire if I bought Apple stock 30 years ago, too. But, yeah, but who knew? You know, that is so, but who knew? so true. So, what, so. so what's, what's something we've been talking about a lot or the, a lot of the, the restrictions here in North Carolina? The, I, mean, the, the, I think the, what, the first executive order, 141, from the mm-hmm. governor that shut everything down. Um, where does that authority come from for, a go- for the governor to just tell businesses, people who – put all of their life savings into a business and now the government says you can't open it. Where, do, where does that authority And that's come a from? great question. Uh, and there, the answer to that question is you have to go in Supreme Court decisions back to 1906 in a, in a case that was settled by the Supreme Court called Jacobson versus the state of Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Um, Jacobson was a recent immigrant from Sweden. Uh, he, he and his family had had a brush with smallpox over there, and it was he didn't want to take the smallpox vaccine in the state of Massachusetts because somebody in his family had died, and he just didn't want to do it, so he refused to do it. Bottom line, the state sued him because it was endangering public health. It went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled against Mr. Jacobson, and they ruled for the state of Massachusetts, and the basic ruling, uh, and you can look it up in Wikipedia and everything. I'm not an attorney, so thank God. But um, look it up, and it'll tell you all the I details. Agree. <laughs> but, but basically what it says was that the state has the power in times of medical emergency to mandate certain things. That, that decision has been tested again and again throughout the century up until now, uh, 1926, 32, 45, and most recently it was in March of this year down in Texas. So the statute that Governor Cooper pulled out was one that basically relied on that ruling. It's been on the books for a long time. Uh Nobody ever did that. Initially, he pulled out another statute that was like a state of emergency, like when you get a hurricane that says the governor can do certain things. The Emergency Management Act? Yeah, that one, with the consent of the Council of State, which is 10 members, includes the lieutenant governor and secretaries of different bureaus, uh, with their consent, and there's a certain time limit on that. He started there. Six said, well, can we talk about this? And the governor said, uh, we well, didn't say really anything. He just put that one to the side and pulled out the medical thing and said, we're going to do this. And every decision since then has been based on the, on the medical emergency statutes, which some people say, well, why don't you impeach the governor? Well, we can't because we know where that law came from, what the basis of it is. So he mm-hmm. hasn't done anything that's impeachable because he's followed the law. It's like, well, why don't you, what do you want me to do, yell at him? It's like, okay, hey, governor, well, don't do it, you know? So, right. I mean, that's the basis of his authority to do that. Now, I think he personally should have stayed with the Emergency Management Act because if you have a hurricane rolling in here, I mean, we've all lived through hurricanes, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you need to make decisions really quick so people don't die and you can get aid to people. This pandemic started in what, February, March. We've been doing this. This has been a long time. I think decisions are better they're not easier but they're better when you have more people have an input into the decision mm-hmm. so i i would much rather that he stay with the emergency management act initially and listen to the lieutenant governor listen to, to the other secretaries and come up with something that maybe he didn't like but i mean th- there's no elected official who's the font of all knowledge there just isn't so with with it coming from almost from the authority of the Supreme Court, there's really nothing other than the Supreme Court that could overturn that. Nothing that the state legislature could do to limit that power. Well, we could pass a law that said uh, open bars. And we actually <laughs> did pass a law that said open bars. I mean, I sponsored one that said open uh, uh, roller skating rinks, bowling alleys, and minor league stadiums, minor league stadiums to 10% and, and put other restrictions on them. I mean, these. these if you're in Fayetteville, we have, you know, the roundabout, they've got two rinks. I mean, I talked to, to them. I talked to, uh, well, they called me, and, you know, bowling alley owners called me and said, look, we're, we're going to go bankrupt. Our whole life savings are going to be eaten up because we can't open. We can do it safely. You know, we had a conversation earlier about bars. I mean, I've mm-hmm. talked to other bar owners. You know, it can be done safely. Now, the pushback on that is some people say, oh, no, you can't. Bar, alcohol, people won't do things safely, blah, 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 you know. But what we've got here is a system now of treating similar establishments really differently. Mm-hmm. You know, and they say, well, follow the science. Well, I'd love to follow the science. The first thing came out and said, don't wear a mask. It doesn't do anything. It was, don't wear a mask. It was, don't wear a mask. Wear a mask. It's like we, we've got 
experts, but you're not an expert in a pandemic unless you've lived through it, in my opinion. You can go read all the literature, mm-hmm. but to for elected officials to just give up their decision making to doctors, no matter how qualified and how many degrees they got hanging on their wall, I think that's wrong because nobody elected a doctor to make policy. They elected me. They elected other people at different levels to make policy. And sometimes politicians make bad calls. Sometimes they make good calls. But you know what? You can go back and unelect me. What are you going to do if the doctor makes a bad call? Uh, you know, and you all go bankrupt because we're. Uh, it's just. You, you know I, something, John? I, I get kind of worked up. I got. I got to say. I got to say. I. I think there's. I have to say, somebody has to be the chief, you know. And in this system, in this country, we elect the chief, right? So, I don't have as much of a problem personally with with the governor or whomever being the one that gets to make decisions in in unprecedented times like this. I mean, if he's not going to do it, who's going to do it? I, I understand as a as a citizen, as a human being, that like. The first thing to do is let's figure out what's going on. But well, listen, we got to shut everything down if we figure out, you know. The problem is, as we talked about a little bit earlier on, is that it's very, some parts of it, particularly in my industry, mm-hmm. is, is very Orwellian. It's very, an uh, uh, in, in animal farm, Orwell said, all animals, animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And right. in, in, in our industry the bar industry you've got places like ourselves a bar not allowed to open but you got countless bars all open because they're a bar that's all that's in a restaurant as you know mm-hmm. and in some cases and of course all the breweries can open i was in one mm-hmm. last week a, a right. wonderful place packed you know people swilling drink and having fun i mean good for them and look it's just insane and when, when the governor was asked about it uh, by one of our Paul Wolverton, I heard uh, he sent me his interview and he asked the governor, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how, uh, to account for this. And the governor said, "Well, the the the, the, the lobby, the restaurant people, organizing wherever they are, uh, had a detailed plan uh, uh, that was accepted by the ec- experts, quote unquote." So dodging that, and then. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I have sympathy for the governor. I think he has to shut stuff down. I understand a lot of what he's trying to do, and I, th- I think he's trying to do the, a good job. And he, in some cases, he is doing a good job. But anyway, uh, um, he, when he said that, and then he said he's asked specifically, Paul pushed him about breweries, and he said, "Well, well, that's because you know they they make the product on on the premises, and it doesn't pass through so many hands." And I, you know, again, you're listening to it, and I want to. You know, I'm not saying nothing bad about. I'm not saying nothing bad about them now, but like breweries are packed, sir, packed <laughs> with people drinking. I thought the I thought the the thing was to stop people congregating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So therefore, <clears throat> all bars should be closed. Any bar anywhere should be closed. The only way you can get a drink, it should be when you're at a table at a restaurant, and you, your waitress gets you a drink, or the waiter gets goes gets you a drink. Not you go to the bar. The bar is closed to the public. You know, don't you just think that's... Well, that, I, I, am I missing something by... No, some I, were I, that way. Some I, I, were that way. And then another recent change happened where yeah. uh, they did allow it. Um, for example, um, even though I was in, in, in some places, and I don't know how they actually ran this, but some places in Dallas, for example, mm-hmm. even though they were open to the public, they you couldn't do uh, at-bar ordering. No. Right, that would make sense. To no me. at bar ordering, for example, because everybody mm-hmm. knows the surface of the bar is covered in coronavirus. Yes, I mean <laughs> everyone knows that. Taking That's two, oh, not just coronavirus, science. guys. Science. Getting up from your table and walking over to that bar, clearly you're going to get the Rona. Um, and, and and some of them do seem very convoluted. Let's let's just be 100 percent honest. They some of them don't make sense, uh, especially here in Fayetteville. <laughs> there are a few places that are I'm not going to name that have been open for you know the last two months maybe mm-hmm. that are clearly bars like there isn't a question they're a bar but they might be attached to a restaurant on the other end and they make a deal with that restaurant to go ahead and serve a little food on the side so they can have some snacks at night um which then now because they serve food they get to go ahead and skirt that a little bit and let's, I, and let's be let's be fair here too let's not because at the end of the day you got to do what you have to do to survive we're fortunate yeah, I'm, not, I'm not hate that's not that's not a, know, a, a they, product of hate I, th- I think i know where that comes from and it it comes from a bigger problem with the <clears throat> with the uh chapter 18b the whole alcohol i talked to somebody who, what was a chapter 14 is the criminal law 
in North Carolina, it's about this thick. And chapter 18, it, it concerns alcohol laws, and it's like that thick. Uh, I think it's it's a problem with that whole system where there's you know two main – I'm going to – I'm not going to talk about hotels, but two main permits you can get. And that's you either get a restaurant permit or you get a private club permit. And so, and that's those are the only right, two right. categories. And so, there's nothing to distinguish a you know a small bar that will hold 20 people versus a nightclub that'll hold 700. There is no nothing that the governor could have put in the executive order that would distinguish between the two. So, the only way to say, okay, restaurants are safe, but bars aren't, is because you can define them based on their permits. And so I think that's where that came from. And what, or I guess you could have said. Well, well we let me do? make no. two points what here. Can we do? The, the, the first thing is, is I'm not going to defend Governor Cooper's uh, rationale because I don't understand it. Because I, I am in complete agreement with you. And as a matter of fact, Republicans in the House and the Senate passed a number of bills to try and force him to open bars, to open bowling alleys and roller skating rinks and things like that. So you might need to have him here next week so he can uh, explain the science that he claims is this is based on i don't know that the uh the, the the second thing point is that what you're really talking to is an issue of fairness that yes, essentially I'm talking about fairness. you're talking about fairness that you're getting treated your business being treated different than other similar businesses but in the same industry yes. in the same industry yes. and that's where i object to the current rules. If he's going to close everybody down, close everybody down. And we're all going to starve or eat grass and rocks in our backyard because, um, you know, <laughs> the, the food line's closed and the Walmart's closed and everything else. It, I, I, but, but to treat businesses in the same industry differently based on the physical characteristics of based on nothing, what they do, it doesn't make no. sense to me, which is why we pushed back against them. Right. And that, but he says he's got this hand on the thermostat. And I guess I do have a third point, too, because I sit on the House Health Committee and listen to Secretary Mandy Cohen for three weeks in a row. I asked her the exact same question because at the beginning of this whole COVID pandemic, the issue was flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. Why did we want to flatten the curve? We wanted to flatten the curve to not overwhelm our hospitals. I know the CEO of the hospital here, and I've been checking with him every single week Near the beginning of the that was the reason for some of the curfews, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that, you'd have to talk so to Mitch Colvin about that one. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they have a 44-bed ICU. They had another whole ward for COVID patients. The I Our ICU here has never been overrun. The COVID ward has never been overrun. So the whole rationale of closing down the economy to whatever extent you're doing it was met early on here in Cumberland County. So the next question is, where wasn't it met? Now, there were places in the state where it got close to filling up an ICU, but there's, according to our CEO of the hospital here, there was never a hospital in danger of being overrun like they supposedly were in New York City. So if we flatten the curve, why aren't we Open opening up? And I asked Manny Cohen three weeks in a row, and then I stopped asking her because I got mumbo-jumbo from her. It's like, if that's the initial thing, what are the metrics you're using to determine when hospitals are, are getting close to the limit? And she'd go all about the number of cases and this and all that. The treatment of COVID has changed so drastically from when it first happened. Mm -hmm. It's getting discovered sooner. There's some things they can do that it makes it not that bad. I mean, yes, I know people who have died from it. And I also know people older than I have that have got it and nothing happened. I mean, they felt sick for That's a day That's what's or two. the scariest so, thing about it. We don't well, know a lot about I, it. Yeah, we don't know. So mm -hmm. in the meantime, we're crunching down the economy that, frankly, a lot of small businesses will not recover from. Mm -hmm. And and that That's is true. not good. It's, right. it's a question of risk management. And no one's ever going to be completely safe. That's what, yeah, it's, it's a moving goalpost. It was mm -hmm. flatten the curve. And then when it's, okay, the, the curve's flattened. Now, like, we have to come up with something else. And when, when they stopped talking about deaths and started talking about cases, right. I, I, that's when I knew we were being toyed with. It's like, you know, because death, okay, it's deadly, it's deadly, deadly. Okay, I get it. Now we have to be closed down. And then all of a sudden, the talk of death stopped. And now we just talk about cases. And so what, what made that switch? Are people not dying as much anymore? Is it not such a catchy headline? Is that why we're not talking about it? And so now we have to use the number of cases as – the reasoning as to why we have to stay shut down. Yeah, I mean, I remember listening to the news myself, and they, I, I clearly remember watching. I think it was like CNN, and, and where they used to talk about the the multitude of deaths that was going to come from it. When uh, those numbers started to come out, and they were like, you know what? It's not 
as deadly, but it is highly contagious. Mm -hmm. So they started, they, 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 they moved the goalposts a little bit. They started talking about the cases more often. And then I'm on the back and thinking, well, wouldn't that be the case with just about any kind of new sickness or virus that mm -hmm. hit a, a hit a population for the first time? Like, well, it's highly contagious. Uh, or rather, this is more contagious. But I'm thinking, if this is the first time it's hit the population and we don't have a herd Im uh, immunity off, you know, off gate, then it wouldn't be surprising that we're going to have a large number of cases the first time it hits the population that's never touched it before. So it, we're talking about something that's very similar to the flu. So I've, I've had a question on the back end, um, which is one that I'm, I'm kind of interested in having an answer in, but there's, I don't think I've found anyone that's going to be able to answer it, and you're probably not going to be able to either, is that we're going to ask you anyway. Okay, that's so, awesome. Because, <laughs> because since this is this... This is this is a COVID family virus. There's a Ranger qualified man right here. Just <laughs> saying, right? Then what 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 that means is does that mean that this is now just going to go ahead and be part of the population as it is and it's going to rotate seasonally, uh, or is it going to be with us for the rest of the the rest of human history? Um, because I can only imagine that during the first onset of the flu, when it hit the human population, I'm sure that it was probably more damaging than what we're experiencing right now, considering, of course, that you know, they didn't have technology to back it up in modern medicine. Um, so we have done this lockdown for what seems to be potentially something we're gonna have to develop a, a, a herd immunity for anyway. Um, so we, we've not only done a disservice to ourselves uh, on that end, we're talking about we're talking about an untold amount of economic damage that we're going to do in the future um, and still have to deal with this virus possibly another five years from now. Um, there's nothing. The CDC hasn't put out anything regarding the fact that there's a good chance that even though we might have, you know, let's just say we flatten the curve here. There's nothing saying that there's not going to be another spike of infections next year or the year after that or the year after that. No. Vaccination. It's, it's uh, something. I'm, I'm going to pull in something that seems unrelated, but uh, um, Nancy Pelosi talking about um, Trump filling the the Supreme Court seat, uh, saying no, oh, he he shouldn't do it, and she was brainstorming different re different uh, ways she could stop Trump. Because I mean, the House House of Representatives has no part. That's between the President and the Senate right. appointing and confirming, and. Uh, and she was talking to a reporter. I don't know which uh, which news news outlet. She was saying, "Well, we might just impeach President Trump. Uh, you could because an impeachment could possibly tie up the Senate." And so, I do. It's I think it's just something as serious as an impeachment can just be used as a political tool to get what you want. Um, it, that's the the age we're living in. What's to stop a governor or? or even a legislature from just doing this at, at any point in the future. Uh, well, oh, people are getting sick. Flu cases are rising. We just need to lock everything Ooh, down. Do you know what that what, just... what's, what's to stop just these really serious things like impeaching a president of the United States or locking down an entire economy? What's to stop elected officials from just using it as a as the political football. Yeah, so it, it actually that that actually kind of reminds me of uh, making me want to drink, boys. <laughs> I mean, because there's yeah, nothing. Me too. That's oh, the system. There's yeah. nothing can stop that. That's the whole way of it. It's yeah. a tactic. Do you remember sequestration? It's, it's dirty yeah. shit. You remember when the uh, when the e when there was a leak about the emails and it came out that the administration said make it hurt as much as possible. Yeah. So sequestration was already on the books. They knew it was going to happen. They let the budget drop, right? And then they had to do those large-scale cuts and pull back on a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. But then come to find out, you know, people are like, oh, you can't go to the parks in, uh, in D.C. Uh, because uh, we don't have anybody to, like, look at these things. We don't have anybody to watch the general public without there. Or they, they, they purposely put up barriers to make sure that people mm -hmm. couldn't go on the, the, na well, the National Mall and see the uh, monuments and, what, and whatnot because of sequestration. And then a leak comes out down the line now, granted, this is past the point of the public's uh, knowledge of this because, you know, there was so much time that went by mm -hmm. that there was an edict that was sent down that simply said, make it hurt as much as possible. Yeah. Because we would do better in this situation if things suck a little bit more. For the people. For the people. Right. Yeah. Um, but but well, um, here's, here's the thing. I mean, and maybe, maybe this is not the right thing to say. Part of my problem with it, man, is that, like, I have to think if the Republicans were in the position that the Democrats are in, they'd probably be doing similar shit. 
And that's th- therein lies the problem. I, I think, honestly uh, think they're weaker, so I don't think they would have done it. But well, whatever. I, <laughs> yeah, just I don't think, think yeah, they're not as bold. I, I think <laughs> I, I think that there's the, the, you know we want you want to solve problems. I think sometimes the dis- the discourse on both sides can get a little uh, tiring, John. I, I, let me just jump in here for a minute since I'm sitting at the table too. Um, yes, <laughs> the these, comment these about these guys like to talk, don't they? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's great listening to it. Uh, because before you went off on uh, Sam, before you went down that road, I, I was going to welcome all of you to the Republican Party. Uh, because you were saying the exact same things that we've been saying to our Democrat friends and the Democrat governor uh, about the the economy here in North Carolina, about opening it up. Um, that, uh, I had a good line. I lost my train of thought. So. <laughs> what was the table? This is how we do it. Oh. This is how we do it. But, okay, right. so, so on, and, and maybe this might jog some of this again. Okay, so <laughs> here's an issue. So three days ago, we get headlines, right, from the Washington Post, and from CNBC, right? Um, I don't know if Samson's going to pull some of these up, but... I can let me see. All right, CDC says... Tell it, something different. Well, yeah, that one's yeah, different, but I, I have it on me on hand right now. Look at that. That's and right. Huh? This, this should anger a lot of people. CDC says it erroneously posted guidance that said coronavirus spreads through air and travel beyond six feet. Washington Post. CDC reverses itself and says guidelines it posted on coronavirus airborne transmission were wrong. So they and, and the the interesting thing is that they they pulled the, they pulled that information back without informing the general public first, mm-hmm. and then at first I think they they the, there was a uh, the agency moved it um, claiming it was a website error. Then come to find out they actually did. So it looks like we are now back to the state where it is just person to person transmission. Uh, don't let somebody spit or lick your face. <laughs> um, you know, uh, don't have John Soka cough near you. And it's sinus problem. Yeah. And, <laughs> but we, we literally made an entire national movement based on this because, you know, the truth be told, when I first heard that it was airborne, I was like, it, this is going to be one of the worst things ever. If you hear something that's going to yeah. be airborne, it's going to be bad. But then we're like, okay, well, it's going to last on the back in the air probably about at least six feet before it actually starts to die off. And that's why we created the six feet rule. And we've got people walking around with eye shields and masks and all that good stuff. And then we have now this on the 21st. This was Monday. Yeah. So the CDC is now reversing uh, its own guidelines concerning Probably. that. The, the fact is we don't I, know, John, right? Well, that's, we, we don't know. That goes back to my point that, in my opinion, we've abrogated political responsibility for serious decisions oh. to doctors who, by proof of this, don't know what they're talking about. Nobody has the solution to this so it goes back to what you said samson about risk mitigation mm-hmm. it's the same thing as running a business are you going to spend capital to increase your business we get it i mean it's all risk reward let's face it we're all going to die one day i mean the mm-hmm. humans don't live forever so how do you protect the most vulnerable among us and so far over 50 percent of the people who have actually passed away from covid have been in congregate living facilities nursing homes uh you know, which is where the majority homes. of death takes place as is. Yeah. Exactly. So, and again, maybe I'm talking about something I shouldn't talk about because I have the advantage of looking backward, but I wouldn't have a problem with locking those places down, except for the fact that there's, uh, my mother passed away a few years ago in her last few years. She'd have died quicker if I wouldn't have went to see her no. every couple of days. So, so you have to balance that too. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you how many people have contacted my office about that very issue wow. where they have loved ones that are in dementia, early stages, or not even in dementia, but I mean, people need to be hugged and loved. Yes. I mean, whether they're yeah. 100 years sad. old or whether they're one year old. It's very mm-hmm. sad. So it's, it's almost, not criminal, but it's, it's, it's almost sadistic to not let family members see there are older family members in those kind of places. So what's the real answer? I don't know. But I do know this is that there's nobody who knows everything. It, it's a risk analysis. Right. And what really angers me is that when one side or the other comes out and says, this is the only way to do something and we're going to protect you because nobody else can and nobody's going to die. That's just stupid. And there's been too much of that going on. Right. You know, I, I, it's just that just drives me crazy. Yeah, one of the things I've hated the most about, uh, especially during a crisis, if there's not well, not just crisis but politics in general, is the 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 idea that we must do something. Like something happens, uh, there's a shooting or there's a there's a crash or whatever the case may be, 
everybody in their mom comes out and say, we must do something. No one actually sits around and thinks about the implications of whatever those policies might have over the course of the next, you know, however it may be. Oh, there was a, the, there was a, there was an unarmed shooting by a police officer. We should defund the police, whatever the case may be. There's there, the, the same response from everyone. So we need someone to do something. My fear of doing something is that you are going to get some, at some point, someone's going to be willing to put someone in place that's going to do something, but they're going to trample over the, your rights in order to actually get that done. Thank you, because you reminded me of what I lost a few minutes ago. <laughs> and, and it has to go with what a person's individual view of the, gov the role of government is. The people who clamor for government to do something look to government to solve their personal problems mm -hmm. and all problems. I don't look to government to solve my no. problems. I don't want the government telling me what to eat. If I want to eat high cholesterol and die of a heart attack, uh, you know, I'll eat high cholesterol and die of a heart attack. Uh, as long as what I'm doing doesn't infringe on your rights. Sure. Pretty, you know, uh, pretty basic stuff. My father-in-law used to say that your rights end at the beginning of I'm my not, nose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but so people want government to solve everything. Government is incapable of solving everything. Right. Matter of fact, government's not capable of solving very much, to be honest with you. Uh, not in this country. I mean, if you want to move to Cuba or Russia, you know, hey, they'll, they'll, they'll solve you know, all your problems. They'll solve, they'll solve all your problems. <laughs> but in this country, they'll and, tell you what your problems are and then solve them. And in the Western yeah. world, yeah. I mean, we rely on individuals to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, for the for the weak and and the people who are permanently disabled, never going to get better, and people who have debilitating diseases and are never going to get better, and people who are down on their luck. I, I mean, I, you know. I'm for government stepping in. I explained this, this to a, a room of fourth graders once. I had this little boy there, and he was obviously from an underprivileged family. And, and he's, the conversation kind of went like this. He says, well, but but what? who's going to help me? And I said, let me ask you a question. Do you have any brothers or sisters? He said, yeah, i got a little sister. And I said, well, if she falls down and skins her knee, what happens? I said, I take her in to see Mommy. And what's Mommy do? Well, she kisses it and puts a Band-Aid on it, and then they go back out and play again. And I hold her hand for a little while. I said, do you, how long do you hold her hand? The rest of the day, the rest of the week, the rest of the month, until she's 80 years old? I, I mean, and the kid got it. He said, well, no, she needs to be on her own. It's like if a fourth grader can understand that, I, it escapes me why some people can't understand that they need to do the best they can to take mm -hmm. care of themselves. You know, and, and those who can't take care of themselves, that's where government needs to step in yes. and take care of them. Mm -hmm. And that is that is they're the magic words yeah. because that's always I, I you always find that the uh, lunatics you know on either side but particularly in this case on the left jump all over that and they leave the other part out you know like you're, what are you talking about man you have to teach people how to fish uh, exactly you know, what I mean? you know so you, and 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 just because you're doing that doesn't mean that you're some kind of asshole who that doesn't want to, that wants them to be hungry that's not what I said you know but people who are hungry we we want to. Uh, make sure that we then can't feed themselves that of course we ha that's what we're supposed to do help our fellow man in every way we can but the best way of helping your fellow man is helping them and teaching them how to help themselves and that's exactly right once again welcome to the republican yeah. party I'm, I, there's this is a great moment should, there, there's right a here on the air that shouldn't be any party that shouldn't be any party that should be just pr that should be principled law or or that thing that both parties agree on. It should, well, be, that it, it should like, be, but it goes to the core of the belief system of what is the proper role of government. Republicans, by and large, tend to believe that less government is better government because everything the government touches, with the exception of the military, it screws up. I mean, you know, I'm in government, and I'll tell you that. Right. You know, it, it does. So it, do you want government telling you how to run your bar? No, I don't. You don't. Do I want to tell them how to run? They just take a bunch of my money. Yeah. I, I remember <laughs> when I was well, a there's that yeah. too. But, but so to they be are sure, telling me how to run. They're it. taking a whole lot less now than oh. they were ten years ago. I'm just yeah, saying. when I was a little yeah. kid, we went to took a class trip to the zoo, and I remember seeing signs all over the zoo. It said, "Don't feed the animals because the animals will become dependent." I, I remember that. It's all over wait, the zoo. Are you calling wow. poor people <laughs> animals, Samson? That's hate speech right there, man. <laughs> So there's gonna be uh, protests that simple, outside here in a few minutes. That simple concept in nature. Well, they don't, have to find this underground bunker they, first. So. I was about to say, there's the sound bite of the, this don't, evening. Don't feed the animals because the animals will become dependent. Wow. Uh, so and so about this mass size. thing, what is the what is the? Uh, oh, um, yeah. So yeah, it's interesting. This kind of got you know dragged up by every every governor in the United States that this is now a uh, 
a reason. I brought this back up because he said something earlier. He said, if, if I want to eat something with a lot of cholesterol, I should be able to. Does this... With does this precedent? This is the Jacobson versus yes. state of Massachusetts but, here. But was is uh, um, I mean, can can a governor use this to say that people shouldn't? Well, you can eat. Hold on, yeah. cholesterol. Well, wait, but if you're giving uh, other people in cholesterol, New York City. Wait, in New uh, York I mean, City, they've right? done in North, New York no. City, they've actually used something similar where they didn't have uh, salt on the table and they banned uh, soft drinks over a certain size. That did happen. No. so. I don't know if they use this specific ruling as the uh, uh, as the basis for it, but it has happened in many other states where certain, like let's say for example with salt, they're like, oh, you're worried about uh, uh, sodium intake. Um, then it was there was a ban in New York City that salt had to be you had to ask for it; it was not available on the table, oh. um, and that goes for soft drinks over a certain sizes as well. Yeah, I, so. I can see a little bit about. I mean, some people are saps, man. Some yeah. people you almost have to kind of help. We are the fattest country. Help not be I had a woman idiot. order. She'd come and order a salad, the chopper salad. It's just some lettuce and tomatoes. And then she would want a bowl of ranch to go with it. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. A bowl of ranch. And it would be, it's to the point where you know how, you know, uh, you have that customer that's like, no, I want a lot of pickles. And the server's kind of, kind of being an asshole, brings them like way too many pickles, like sarcastically. You know, this woman wanted that amount <laughs> of ranch. And, yeah, she's a large one. Disgraceful. Are you a ranch um, man, John? Are you a ranch but, man or are you a ketchup yeah. man? I'm more Thousand Island. Yeah. Thousand Island? Okay. I might, this, this might be a dumb question it, you know, about the, the legislature. So uh, you have standing committees and you have select committees. Select right. committees are for just specific... S special uh, purposes, purposes for a limited amount of time. Okay. So you're also a member of the... Um, wait, let me see here. Oh, no, you're a, a chairman of the House Select Committee on Community Relations, Law Enforcement, Justice. Yes. What was that created for? Uh, that was created in the wake of the George Floyd uh, death, mm -hmm. um, that there was a huge clamoring for North Carolina to do something. So, I, I, you know, to, and to, to your point, to do it, something. It's, to your, yeah. it's to your point. Now, to be fair, uh, there are some, some things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. There are some, some things that have been talked about in various parts of the state and different uh, sheriff's organizations, different uh, police departments, that you have differing standards uh, throughout the state. So what this is doing, we're breaking it. And we actually have a committee meeting next Monday morning. We had our first committee I, meeting I chaired. We got some background. Well, first, let me back up a minute. We've got uh, Republicans, Democrats on here, probably a total of 16, 17. We reached out into the community across the state. We have judges. We have our own district attorney, Billy West. He's the yeah, past Billy. president of the, of the DA's association. We have Troy Williams, a, a local activist uh, there. Uh, we have different people specifically chosen from conservative backgrounds and liberal backgrounds and minority backgrounds. And we tried to get as, as good of a group representative of the state and differing opinions as we could. So we sat down. We Except had a political blackout. Yeah, whatever. We'll well, continue. had you nobody uh, knows uh, nobody knows called me, I might have got your seat. Come on up next uh, Monday. Anyway, um, so really two big things. Policing first. We tackled that first. We had some briefings on that from some experts, and one from Duke University and one from I forget where she was. But uh, to, to tell us kind of what are the statistics of police killings of unarmed people in our state, you know, Whites, blacks, whichever side, who's shooting who, whatever, whatever circumstances. And mm -hmm. it was kind of eye-opening that there, in, in my opinion, there's not a immense, huge problem uh, with that solely based on the numbers. But then you got to look into each case. So what we did is we told folks instead of what, what usually happens in committees is you sit in the committee room and all the experts or people who want to have a say come to you and talk, and then we ponder deep thoughts and make decisions. What we did differently on this one was, it's like we have all you folks in here from across the state, from all kind of different backgrounds. What, what we want you to do is we want you to return to your community, community get input from whoever you're gonna get input from, NAACP, uh, Black Lives Matter, the police department, sheriff's department, who, get your community involved talking to you. Because what happens when people come to Raleigh 
they uh, act for the cameras. They want their 60 seconds or 120 seconds on cameras, so they go all wild one side or the other, and they say stupid stuff, and nothing ever happens. So we decided to do it differently this way. So right now in preparation, I asked everybody to get their uh, comments and suggestions, not comments, but their suggestions on what we can do in policing by Monday, which was, this is Thursday, three days ago. So the, the staff, we have over 120 different suggestions on different things that range the gamut from all kinds of stuff, some maybe good ideas, some crazy. I mean, who knows? So what we're going to do on Monday is we're going to go through. Oh, they all oh wait, there it was. Yeah. Oh, we're going to go through these. It's a good-looking bunch. Uh, Sorry, yeah, John. Especially that guy right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so go ahead. We're, we're going to go through these. So if 10 people said, I want to do A, that's the first one we're going to tackle. We're going to discuss that and see, is there validity to suggestion A, and if there is, what do we need to change it? Is this good enough? So hopefully we can distill this 120 plus ideas down to something that's manageable that makes sense. And when we get done with that, and it's gonna be an all day committee meeting, then a couple weeks after that, then we're gonna say, okay, these are the suggestions that we have so far, and then we'll ask for public comment. And if people wanna come up and mug for the cameras, well, you know, we'll. We'll listen to them too, but we're really trying to get people with differing backgrounds, different histories, different ideas to come together and, and really actually do something. We don't need to have a two year long study on, uh, on anything. I mean, sure. p people already have their opinions formed, so let's hear them. Let's, let's see if we can do something mm -hmm. that actually makes sense, not something for the sake of something, but something that make, uh, an example here might be the, the chokeholds. Do they need to be banned throughout North Carolina? No, I don't know. I mean, it depends on who you talk to. If, mm -hmm. if, when you talk to a police officer, if they've got somebody who's drugged up and they weigh 300 pounds and they're a linebacker for you know a football team, I, they're saying, <laughs> "How you get? What are you gonna do with that guy?" You know. Well, so I mean, I don't it's know. tough. It's it's a it's a very tough thing. The, the, something you said. Uh, sorry, I lost me trying to talk. Oh, go on, go on. This made me think of a fun game. Actually, I don't know if we could 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 we uh, figure out you know. Who's Republican? Who's Democrat? About to know. look at them. They already know. <laughs> I'm a Republican. They already know that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I want to say Democrat right here, but I don't know. She is representative. Oh, okay. All right, she definitely looks like she wants to speak to the man. Uh, that's a, that's <laughs> a, oh she, man. Let me tell you about her. Look at her dog. hair. She got a great. She got a. I love her hair. She's got a huge pink streak in there, and sometimes different well, colors. God bless she, her. She is a Democrat. Uh, she's fairly liberal, but she's somebody I can work with. Actually, I tried to help her get one of her bills passed. It didn't pass. But I worked uh, real closely with her. She's, she's, she's a nice she's person. A yeah, she's yeah. a nice person. I mean, I'll work with her. But pick another one. Here, here. Oh, here we got here. I don't know. Ernest, pick one. What do you got? You got to identify. I mean, I, I took the I took the gimme. I mean, it's already gimme, but I'm going to say uh, yeah. Rep P. Jones. Rep P. Jones. Rep P. Jones. <laughs> what do you think? He looks like Ron Paul, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah he does. but because of that around him, I'm going to give him a, I'm going to put a D rather than an R in front of his name. All right. Really? Well, he's a Republican. Damn. Oh. He's oh, Dr. No. Perrin Jones. Yeah. Um, uh, he's um, he was appointed to the seat when uh, Representative Murphy got elected to Congress when Congressman I forget his name died in the eastern part of the state. Murphy went out and Dr. Perrin Jones uh, took his place. Um, he's a doctor. He is a doctor. He's a, a, as is if you scroll down a little bit or up the other way. Uh, Dr. Kristen Baker. She's a doctor as well. She's okay. a, a psychiatrist. And he's a. Uh, she's definitely conservative. Yeah, she is. She's I hope he's not. Uh, Baron you know. Jones is a urologist. A urologist, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. If right. this guy's not a Republican, I'll chug my whole drink. I tell you, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, I was gonna, uh, Keith Kidwell is a Republican. Okay. Yeah. 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 What a number. He's got yeah. an interesting story. He's got a. What a uh, scowl on that uh, face. <laughs> he's a softy inside. He's a big guy. I tell you, what. but uh, guy, he owns yeah. a number of H and R Block. Uh, services and so when it comes to taxes, it's it's uh, good I mean, man to know. That's, that's he's a good guy. guy, and he's on the finance yeah. committee with me. I was gonna say, your man Jones, that Dr. Jones, there, you know, man, he's, yeah. I mean, this guy, he's got to have a lot of knickers getting thrown at him, does he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Nick, so, you know, oh, friend, friend of the ladies, he doesn't understand Nick, what you're saying. He's a friend of the ladies, women's underwear. I mean, oh, oh, he's, I mean, I'm not, I, I, he's, I'll he's like, happily married. I, I'm not a gay some, man now, but I mean, but if I was if I was a gay man, I'd be like, 
I don't know if someone asked. Doctor, yeah. you say? Yeah. Yeah. Doctor. Doctor. Doctor is happily married Damn. with a number of kids. Uh, introduce me. There we go. I don't know. Well, that was a fun I, game. I, I, Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, well, it's, 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 welcome. I'm not welcome sure how I was going to go. So I don't want to get too much deeper into that one. Yeah. Uh, uh, just uh, welcome I'll, to, I'll welcome to a fun yeah. game <laughs> called Guess the Political guess Affiliation. The political. It well, is, it's fun. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, there's one more that um, Samson, I actually want you to jump in and help me out with this one. Okay. But uh, before we actually really move to the, the cultural stuff, because that's where the... Uh, that's where the really... That's the fun stuff. Um, okay. So, I all right, so that, I remember yeah. reading once uh, a, an objection somebody had on your Facebook page regarding the... Because um, clearly there's there's quite a lot of support that you do have out there for you know military folks and whatnot. Right. And, and I, I do specifically remember reading uh, about uh, so the relief more so for the smaller businesses. So for the people that are let's because there there seems to be a lot that have been done for those that are military background. Can what can we uh, what can you say to those that are on the small business end in North Carolina? Uh, what are we doing for them during the for the impact of COVID? The state received over a billion dollars in CARES Act funding from the federal government. And uh, when they passed that, it came with strings attached that it had to be used for COVID-related things. So uh, there were the national um, programs, and we also put some state programs in there where we did matching money that uh, small businesses could apply for loans and grants. Uh, I forget, I think it was $200 million. I, I, I don't remember the, the amount, but there were programs that were out there. We tried to publicize that uh, as well as we could. Um, government can't bail out every small business, which comes back to the point of why are we closing small businesses down yeah. when you're letting uh, grocery stores and Walmart and Lowe's? And I got nothing against Walmart and Lowe's and the, the rest of them. I mean, I shop there too. Oh, well, people have to eat. But, they have to get their food. People yeah. got to eat. But I mean, anybody who's been in one lately, people don't social distance. I mean, they, they, they're complying with the law. They got the stickers on the floor, but there's no one way aisles and people are just passing each other. The only difference is they're wearing masks. I mean, I, I, unless you all have a different experience than I do, going to shop for groceries, that's what I see. True, well, but at this point, the cat's, yeah. are, the cat's kind of already out of the bag. So we're in this position and we're stuck. And the, and the federal government did, did give these funds. So for, you know, for example, somebody that's been, somebody, a business that's been closed for the last uh, four months, um, what do we say to them going forward? The only thing I can say to them is, is that I'm a small businessman myself. And I'm for small business. I did everything I could in the legislature to force the governor to open small business. I voted for the bill to open the bars because I think that you're a responsible owner of a business. I sponsored the bill to open roller skating rinks, <laughs> bowling alleys, and minor league uh, stadiums with the minor league stadiums so they could sell food to 10% of the seating capacity. I picked those because those were people who called me and because I didn't want to because I thought a broad bill to open everything, well, that we actually passed one of those, but it failed. So I was saying, well, okay, these three types of businesses have a plan. They got a plan. Makes sense to me. Looks like a good plan to me. I'm not a medical professional, but it looks like a good plan to me. Well, I got vetoed. So we've had a, a number of these things, of these bills, that we've tried to do what we could do. Republicans can. Sometimes there was every once in a while a Democrat would come across and help us, but not very often. And the governor vetoed him. We didn't have the votes to override the veto. Uh, that's how government works. Whether you like it or not, that's how it works. Do you believe that the – okay, so let's just say – okay, do you believe that the the, the Democrats that didn't cross the aisle um, – because for the most part, I would say most Democrats I run into are, are pretty, let's say, free-feeling kind of people. Do you think that they did it only because they, they wanted to be in lockstep with the governor? Or do you think that – uh, they actually believe that, for example, keeping, I don't know, Patty's clothes, for example, uh, is actually going to be better for the population. I, I think it was a mixture of both of those. Some people, uh, Representative Greg Myers from up in Orange County, told the story of how his daughter, 20-something, worked at a bar in Charlotte who had opened illegally, and she got COVID. because mm -hmm. there. Uh, so I, I, I think it's a mixture of that. Um, some people who depend on the governor's fundraising to fund their campaigns. Uh, I, I would say they voted with the governor to keep him happy. And I think there are other people like Greg Myers who actually thought that it was the right thing to do. I mean, it's okay to disagree. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, that's 
hell, I don't agree with myself all the time. But um, and that's a mature way of looking uh, yeah. at it because no one's trying to screw up. It's just what do we do from from here on out, rather than be attacking people for what they've already decided to do. It's what we do from here on out, like you were asking. I think is very important. Like I mean, like okay, you got it wrong, fine. I mean, you you said it in the beginning, John, that you know that nobody's gone through this before. You know, I'm assuming that the governor the governor gets up every morning thinking of ways to mess it up more. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't agree with that. I mean. You know, I would hope he doesn't think that. Um. <laughs> I'm going to give I'm going to give the man the respect that he obviously doesn't do that. You know, but uh, it would be just nice to know going. And, and I'll give him that too. I'm not right, going to argue. Right, right. I, I don't think he. Nobody wakes up intentionally saying, well, of course I'm not. I screw up the economy of today. Of course not. Mm, but, um, well, I don't know. Bill Maher does. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're probably right. But it's. <laughs> Okay, let me rephrase that. Most people don't wake up figuring out. <laughs> Honest how they can people screw up. don't. Honest well, people don't. Yeah. So what's your uh, what, what's your? I mean, if you had to, if I, you know, maybe it's a bad analogy. If I put a gun at you, so give, you know, tell me, what do you think is going to happen? To uh, just in general, when do you think? What do you think is going to happen in general? The, like for instance, I believe. We're going to have medical advance. We're going to have a vaccine that most people won't take. But the real, the, the real savior will be, will be therapeutics. I think you know, and because we're, without it, we're, we're, you know, I think that's, you know, like you said earlier, that they're starting to get the situations yeah. where they can. People are not dying from it, and when they can secure that, you know, we can get back to some normality. But do you have any? If you were to guess, you know what I mean? Maybe if you're a, maybe asking me for a bad. date, I would say uh, November fourth. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's why I was. And you really believe that? Everybody says that. Yeah. I, I, I believe that. That's gonna make the day me, after my birthday. Yeah. That's oh, well, gonna make a lot day. of people really pissed, man. I really, uh, mad, really mad. I, you know I, that that was really the it the whole time. I mean, I would <laughs> like to think that. Well, let's let's just be honest. Okay, there is a political component to this. Yes, there is. Now on that, both sides. I don't argue with that. And, and I'm not. I, I I wish that there wasn't, but there is, and. Political parties being what political parties are, each is trying to uh, work it to their advantage. Maneuver. Sure. I think in our state, however, that we should have turned the governor's thermostat or whatever he calls his controller earlier to open up more of the economy. It's been done in other states, uh, and everybody hadn't died. Um, it, it, but it, it goes back to what you said. It, it, it's a risk analysis. Mm hmm you cannot prevent everyone from contracting an right. airborne virus. You cannot right. prevent people from living, and you should from living. Yeah, and you shouldn't prevent people from engaging in the things that they do to live. I, I've, yeah, you know, I've got a couple of women who work for me in uh, my mortgage branch. They are going out of their minds with ha having to do this distance learning with kids. Mm. Uh, they both have fifth graders, and uh, you know, fifth graders are wonderful little beings, but th they're not made to sit in front of a screen. There's a reason that for the past, oh, I don't know, a thousand years, we've <laughs> taught people by being in person, mm -hmm. not by some magic screen that you're supposed to stay glued to. And I'll tell you what, personally, I'm so sick to death of Zoom meetings that I just want to <laughs> vomit every time I have to get on another one. I I turn the video off, I turn the sound on unless I, off unless I have to say something. It's just like... I don't want to look at you. I don't want to, I, I mean, no offense, but no. I don't want to look at your head staring back at me with the dull, vacant look in your eyes. I I, I don't want to. I, don't, I think so. I, I kind of like the Zoom meetings because I think, I think a lot of good things also came from the quarantine. People that didn't normally reach out started reaching out through Zoom. It's kind of like social media with the advent of Facebook. People who we you know, were disconnected for years, decades, reconnected. Um, Facebook's a whole different thing now. I work for a fortune company. Like, yeah, company. I'm I, tired of but, it. Uh, but I, I think you haven't been on enough Zoom yeah. meetings with that. Oh, I have not. I have not been. I have not been. But for example, my uh, my grandmother, who's 180 years old, she um, we 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 started doing a Zoom meeting with all the all my cousins, all her grandchildren. That we normally, I mean, I hadn't seen my grandmother in two years. Only like special family occasions. So you're saying Cisco's not hurting for money for right now? Yeah, as well. We Cisco's doing good. We decided that you know, let's do a Zoom meeting every month with Grandma, and she could tell well, us that's her story. Cool, she could tell us her stories, yeah. and she just that's what she looks forward to every month. So I think, I mean, yeah, if that's all, if that's the only way you can interact with people, I'd be sick of it too. But I think there is some positives. It has connected some people that 
that weren't as connected before. So I think there are some positives. You try sure WebEx. Yeah. WebEx no. is probably a good but, idea. But yeah, the, 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 as far as the risk management goes, it's it's something we do every day that we as a society can't figure out how to do now and open up, but we we all do it every day. We we know that if we get into our car and get on the road, there's a risk there. Mm-hmm. There's I mean there's a, a pretty heavy risk that we might get an accident, we might die, but we decide actually I need to go get groceries. The risk is worth it. I have to go to work. The risk is worth it. I mean, the risk is small compared to the risk of not having any money because I didn't go to work. You know, why can't we do that as a it's gonna as a country and, and realize that the risk the risk of keeping the economy shut down the way it is is not worth it. You know, it'll get to that point. People because it goes back to what Ernest said. People want you to do they want something. something. Yeah, something, right. and that's the Tell, danger. So, t- can we ask this gentleman about? I'd love to know about your. Uh, don't you have a You've got a, you're, you've got a political race you're running. Well, I'm not here to talk about my opponent. You can research her all you want to. There we go. Uh, I think I'm the better person to uh, well. for the seat. And I can tell you everything I've done in the last eight years, where my focus are. You want to hear that? I'd love to hear what, you know, in the, in the time you've been in there, what you feel like you've been able to get done. I'd love, you know. Okay. Uh, but, and see, that's a question I'll answer. There we go. Uh, you can have my <laughs> opponent on here if you want to ask her what you And also done. what you'd like to get done by the time you're done Absolutely. with this stuff. Right. Um, I've been there for four terms, finished my fourth term, so I've been there for eight years. Uh, The first, I've passed a total of 33 bills that I have been the primary sponsor on. So, uh, and they kind of break down like this. Uh, 10 or 11 have been military focused. The very first bill I passed was uh, one that restricted protests at military funerals. If you think back to that, Mm whatever it was out of Kansas, that crazy Baptist church. W- Waynesboro Baptist. Uh, yeah, whoever yeah. they were. That was insane. That, that was Westboro, insane. West, Westboro, Westboro Baptist. Westboro Baptist. Yeah. They came here. They did come here, yeah. and they protested a, a funeral down yeah. in Rayford. Yeah. You saved they their came, lives, yeah. I think. They came I, to the wrong I, spot. Yeah. I probably did. Yes, which, you did. Mm-hmm. But there hasn't been any of those protests since that bill wow. uh, got passed. That's which, awesome. Which was an interesting bill because there was already a law in place, but we extended the time and the distance from – military funerals up to two hours before and after and the distance up to 500 feet. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, interesting that the ACLU had primed the other side, certain people on the other side, to really take me to task on the floor uh, and debate on that. And I got up and uh, I explained exactly why it was two hours before and it was 500 feet. Uh, In my first tour when I was the 25th Infantry Division in Schofield Barracks, Hawaii, I was an officer in charge of a burial detail and it was a uh, uh, internment of uh, a former soldier who was a Buddhist. And <laughs> in the Buddhist tradition, at least what they did in Hawaii, was it was a happy time of him passing into the afterlife. And we did the military thing with the 21-gun salute and folded the flag and presented it to it. Now, they invited us to stay and partake of a picnic around the, the, the grave site, and it's like, I, it was very bizarre, and I, I'd never done that before, and there were a lot of flowers and singing and things like that. We didn't stay for two hours, but I said, well, how long will this last? Because we had to get back to post and thing. I said, well, two to three hours. And I said, I could, well. So I explained that, uh, my experience, to uh, the other side, to everybody, <laughs> and the ACO just dropped the whole thing. And the, it passed in the law because yeah. if we're going to respect Christians, we're going to respect Buddhists, we're going to respect Muslims, sure. so we're going to respect mm-hmm. everybody. Yes. And because of my experience, I was able to get that law passed in the ACL, and it's still on the books. The ACL never that's attacked great. it. Right. So, I mean, that's the kind of thought that goes into laws. I do. So I've got a number of military bills. One that has uh, put in a couple times that I constantly get asked about that hasn't passed yet because. To be a, a legislator, you have to know how to do sixth grade math. In, in sixth grade North Carolina, they teach you uh, uh, percentages and fractions. Mm. So you have to know how to calculate 50% plus one. If you can't do that, you got no business <laughs> being elected to anything. Okay, mm. so one of the things I can't get to 50% plus one on for a whole number of reasons I won't go into detail on is to exempt military retired pay from North Carolina state income tax. I put it in, hasn't passed. I'm going to put it in next year, and maybe we'll get some. Well, a couple people who are against it I know are retiring. They won't be back, so maybe I can get it passed. That's surprising. Of all states, that's an issue. I, I, 
Fifty percent plus one, sixth grade math. Uh, oh. So I've done that. Um, I'm a senior finance chair of House Finance uh, Committee. There's two major, the two biggest committees in the House uh, are the Finance Committee, which deals with tax policy. We figure out how the state's going to get money in, and then Appropriations, which appropriates the money that comes in and and spends it. So uh, my very first year there, I worked with a number of other. Uh, representatives actually it was the bill that i was one of the primaries not the primary but you know the primary in the first position it was david lewis at the time then three other primaries then you can co-sponsor which means you see a bill that's uh, on there yeah there we go yeah. with julia and uh, mitchell um uh you co-sponsor means you see a bill that's filed and you think it's a great thing you want to put your name on it because things great so i was a primary sponsor on house bill 998 which was comprehensive tax reform in 2013. And we could talk tax. I could talk tax all day long about how we flattened it. Please do. I love it. Day, well, <laughs> no, I, 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 I mean, for your income level, probably went from seven and a half percent state income tax. Oh. It went to five nine nine. Now we're down at five and a quarter. So depending Not on. Not too bad. Wait, it's uh, fixed, uh, correct? Is that our, our is our tax structure still uh the progressive it, it, or it's, it it's, is is a flat tax. It's flat. All right, versus, good. That's yeah. Right. Okay. Now, and I get hit on that. Well. You, you like millionaires and billionaires. So, well, first of all, there's not that many millionaires and billionaires in the state. But the fact of the matter is that the tax structure in North Carolina now, we've worked it on both ways. We've flattened the tax. Now it's five and a quarter. We also increased the standard deduction. And usually we talk in married filing jointly. And if you're single, I can go to those numbers too. But uh, prior to 2013, the first $6,000 of your North Carolina taxable income was exempt from tax. So in addition to lowering the tax rate, we also increased that 6,000. First it went to 15, then it went to 17, now it's up to $20,000. So that doesn't help a millionaire or a billionaire or, or 100,000 there, if that's a word. Yeah. Who that helps is the people who are at the lower and moderate end of the income scale, the people who are maybe waiters and waitresses, maybe working in retail. So if they're making $45,000 a year under a under the previous tax plan, they could only, married filing jointly, only not pay tax on 6,000 and everything was taxed. Now it's the first 20,000. So if you do the math, and I'm a math guy, if you do the math, it really helps people at that end of the income scale a whole hell of a lot more than it does people at the higher end. So I, I'm, we've continued through that. We've expanded the base, which has allowed us, the taxing base, which has allowed us to lower the uh, individual rates. We've also at the same time lowered the corporate income tax rate. Um, but when we did that, when we lowered these things, we took away numerous. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't believe the special cutouts and things that were in both the corporate tax and the individual income tax. So if you're going to do that, and we talked before the show here about fairness, treating people mm -hmm. fairly. Uh, we took a lot of that stuff, most of that stuff out. There's loopholes and things. All, all the loopholes. Uh, I, I'm going to give you an example of that. There was a personal loophole that for people who received the golden parachute, that was not tax, That was not to be counted. You know, we're talking about highly compensated executives. They got a golden parachute. That wouldn't be taxed as income. It's like, what? That, that makes sense. So we took yeah. that away. I don't know who put it in there, but we took it out. Yeah. You, you know? Uh, we limited certain deductions. So when it's overall done, that people, the middle class who ends up paying most of the income tax anyway, ended up paying less because we made it fairer. So I've done a lot of work in uh, tax policy. Yes, and dog food, I haven't done much for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's uh, the, the, <laughs> the other thing that I've done a lot of is in energy policy. I'm also a senior chair. Uh, probably a, find a, that senior, somewhere, yeah. a senior chair of the House look at those faces. Energy and Public Utilities uh, Committee. Um, when I first went to Raleigh, the only thing I knew about energy was if you see a light switch on the wall, when you push it up, the lights go on. And when you push it down, the lights go sure. off. And like most people. Uh, like most people. <laughs> and right now, uh, that's right, uh, I will uh, tell you that I'm, I, I'm not bragging. I'm just <laughs> telling you facts. I'm nationally recognized as a leader in renewable energy policy and energy policy in general. Because when I was my first term up there, I had a lobbyist from 
uh, Sustainable Energy Association come to me and say, what do you think about solar energy? And I puked back to her what right-leaning uh, journals think, well, it wouldn't, exist, it wouldn't exist without tax incentives, and if you took out all the props that are propping up the industry, it wouldn't, it'd go away, blah, blah, blah. She said, well, I've got a little bit different opinion. Uh, here's some information. Would you like to read? I said, sure, I read it. And the old inquiring minds want to know. She said, if you have any questions, call me back. So I called her back, had some questions, and I did this kind of back and forth between her and some uh, a, a major energy company in North Carolina uh, to, to figure out <laughs> where truth really was. And I came to the conclusion that truth was, was at that point in time in 2013-14 that solar energy wasn't quite the lowest cost source of energy, but it was rapidly on its way to being there. So uh, I studied it more, and I'm now the... <laughs> pretty much leading solar advocate in the legislature and as a Republican mm. in this state has been kind of weird. That's um, yeah. That's... In, in other states, they, they get it. So we've been a little slower to adapt, but I can tell you that right now today sitting around this table is that solar energy is the least cost form of energy. It just is. Now, uh, somebody from a major energy company would say, no, it's nuclear energy it only costs four cents per kilowatt. It's like, okay, and you're right, it does. So on a per kilowatt, but have we built a new nuclear plant lately? What's it cost to build a new nuclear plant as opposed to what's it cost to build uh, so, a new solar, solar, solar field? So when you, when you actually end up comparing apples to apples, solar is the lowest cost. And now we've got uh, industrial sized batteries that, it, you know, one of the criticisms used to be, well, when the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow, you're not gonna get energy and you can sit in the dark. Well, yeah, whatever, you know, they have, there are ways to smooth the curve and things. But now with battery storage, it's become economic. The big argument is, and whether we need batteries or not, the big argument is, is it inside the fence of the private solar developer who developed it so he can make more money selling it? Or is it outside the fence and the energy companies so that they take it when the sun is shining, they store it and they sell it? So that's those are the kind of things we're in now. All right, so here's a question wow. on that on that topic. Yeah. So there's there's one objection I've always heard regarding that, and that is the amount of land that is necessary in order to actually have a solar farm to begin with, um, because from what I under, from what I've read in terms of objections there is that the uh, that what is potentially just free open land or sizable like farmland is what's being used or, or what would have to be used in order to actually um, give energy to a large amount of people. So right. that that there's there's let's just say there's more land that would need that would need to be occupied with solar panels than there would be houses that would actually be able to use that that amount of energy uh, and that's a, a very good question and uh, we actually had the Department of Agriculture and this is going back a couple of years look into that very issue so were we losing more valuable farmland mm -hmm. that we needed to keep but but the farmland isn't my farmland. It's not your farmland. It doesn't belong to the state. It belongs to the farmer. So uh, there's a property rights issue there that uh, <laughs> a farmer ought to be able to do whatever he wants to with the land he bought and paid for or is paying mm -hmm. his mortgage on. That's issue number one. And issue number two is is that I forget the actual percentage, but it was incredibly small, like point something of farmland, good farmland that had been used uh, for solar farms. Um, and solar panels, the technology on that is becoming better and better and better. So they're actually becoming more of efficient. Um, the, the issue, the biggest issue, I, I, if I'd known this was going to be here, I'd block, brought my slides. Oh, man. <laughs> because, uh, because there's two slides that I usually show at the beginning of most presentations I give because there's this tension between technology and policy. And the first slide is a slide of uh, Madison Avenue, New York City in 1900 when it just shows a bunch of uh, uh, horse-drawn carriages and wagons and stuff and there's one car in there and then it showed it was Easter weekend and Easter weekend in 2013 it shows roughly the same part of Madison Avenue New York City that you can't even see a horse-drawn anything there so what happened well we all know that automobiles didn't take over the world by 1913. Mm -hmm. So what happened was in New York City, it was a policy decision by the mayor and the borough presidents to ban uh, horses from the center of Manhattan because they did they were tired of doing with the manure. I mean, tons and tons and tons. So you had to have a car. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, the Army's cavalry didn't go away until the 19th. There's horse cavalry. didn't go away uh-huh. until right before World War II. So it was policy. So the, the, the biggest challenge that policymakers have is trying to keep the laws current with where technology is going. It's become more and more difficult as we go on. Uh-huh. Um, and, and that's the way I look at it. So with renewable energy, in 2017, there was a House bill. It was House Bill 589. Competitive Energy Solutions for North Carolina that changed the way it took a year to negotiate between Duke and Dominion and the independent power producers and the, the solar developers and the 29 electric co-ops and, and the environmental groups. Uh, I mean, you talk about uh, uh, <laughs> negotiation. It was long and arduous. And it came down to the end where Representative Arp, Dean Arp, uh, the other chair and myself got everybody, and I intentionally I, I put my colonel hat back on. It's like mm-hmm. we got to get this hammered out. So I called a meeting the Saturday in Raleigh before Mother's Day in 2017. Say we're going to hammer this out. We're not going home until we get it hammered out. And surprisingly, uh, everybody was willing to uh, you know kind of do things because they wanted to be home for Mother's Day. So we got <laughs> it hammered out. We got negotiated. It got passed. It changed the way. Uh, the compensation structure and the way solar energy is brought onto the grid, which made it fairer for more fair for solar developers. It made it more fair for Duke um, and Dominion. Uh, and basically, the end result of that, Duke estimates at the time was in 2017 that it was going to save $850 million for ratepayers, not for Duke Energy, but for ratepayers. And we're here in Fayetteville. If you that go back, that should be headline news, man. I, it, well, it was. It, you never heard about it before, right? Okay, that was my bill. I'm really proud of that. I got to tell you, it's um, awesome. PwC buys the overwhelming majority of their energy from Duke Energy because of that bill. Now, PwC, well, we're tough negotiators, and they probably are, but because energy is cheaper for Duke to sell to them, PwC made this announcement last May, I think, a year ago that, uh, and they buy the. They sign these contracts for multi-years that actually is savings being passed on to everybody who's on PwC, everybody who's on a co-op, everybody who's a Duke customer. It, it's being passed on. It doesn't necessarily mean that your bill's going to go down, but any increases in the future will be smaller uh, than they would have been had we not changed the way this is done. So energy, I'm, I, I'm like, <laughs> I'm sold out to finding the least cost energy for industry and consumers. And yeah. that's, uh, so I've done a lot of military things, done a lot of bills in the finance taxing arena that has saved both individuals and companies at all ends of whatever economic scales you are, it saved them money. And that also brings more business to North Carolina. I mean, right mm-hmm. before COVID, Cumberland County had the lowest unemployment rate that it's had in over 40 years. And it wasn't by magic. It was because business was booming. Uh, and, and everybody, yeah, everybody wants was. another good year to come. And we it look, was. And, and, yeah, I know. And we yeah. look for the good years to come when we look for all that. But there's been a heck of a lot of increase in business um, for any number of reasons. And, so, and then in energy, saving people money. So I, I just try to do come up with policies that if I'm saving me money and I'm saving you money, mm-hmm. it's probably good policy. Right. So, that, so that's where my focus is. Okay, so I have, I have a question. So I work in IT. So this is, is going to be a little IT-ish type question, but it's going to actually have a little right. – we're going to have a little um, – Boring moving on. Next question. <laughs> we're going to have a – there's, there's going to be a little there's, – there's a little government uh, uh, mix in there. So high-speed internet. Right. Should it be a utility? One, first question. <clears throat> Two, if it is going to be a utility, uh, how is the government then going to pick and choose said ISP to provide said service? That's a great question. And actually, I was wrong. There's four things which I really focus on. <laughs> <laughs> and and <laughs> se- no, seriously, uh, broadband mm-hmm. is high-speed broadband. My goal is to get uh, high-speed broadband connections to the last house on the last dirt road in the most remote county in this state. And I've been working on that for about six years. Now, who's going to do it? Well, uh, that's <laughs> this might take a minute or two to explain because first you have to measure what is high-speed broadband. The uh, FCC says they use census blocks, 
and they say if any business or household in a census block, and a census block, and I mean, census block here could be uh, the four blocks we're sitting in right now, because mm -hmm. it's dense residential. Up in Linden, it could be four square miles. So if one in Linden has it, then it, the whole census block is considered served, which is just crap. I yeah. mean, that just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the way Congress allocated money to the Connect America program, which was given money to the CenturyLinks and the AT&Ts and all those kind of companies to extend it, they based it on census blocks. So I worked really closely with Senator Tillis on this and with Congressman Hudson. I'm not just saying this because they're up for re-election. I, I mean, this is real work that's taken years to accomplish to get the FCC to admit that they're wrong because bureaucracy doesn't ever like to admit they're wrong. So that was the first thing. So how do you get there? Um, quite frankly, this was kind of in this, a little bit of a kind of against the grain kind of stuff in my party on some things. Broadband was one of them because some folks say, well, if they want to, if, if you want to have broadband, it's a service, pay for it. And other people like me say, because I'm looking at the future, or I'm looking at the here and now and the future, it's, it is a service that I pay for, but what, for the, what about the school kids in the last single wide on the last dirt road uh -huh. out in Beaver Dam? I, I've been there to Beaver Dam Elementary. I've been to those houses. We're handicapping our kids. So I say it's infrastructure. And if COVID has done nothing else, it has shown that high-speed broadband connection is infrastructure. And I've said this yes. in committees. It's infrastructure. It's not a service. So now this is one good thing that's come out of COVID. Everybody agrees with me now. So what we've done, uh, there was a bill passed that uh, ARP was the, in the first position, and I was in the second position. We passed the bill, uh, the Great Grant Program. This was two years ago. Uh, $15 million a year for 10 years that we would give grants to – uh, counties or municipalities, it, primarily focused on counties, that would come up, uh, if they could find a private partnership, a public-private partnership, because it costs money to put internet in, and really the, the adoption rate, you got to be paid back for it because nothing's free. So uh, we've, every year, the $15 million is gone with uh, CARES Act money, we put another $40 million into that. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to be connecting everybody real time soon. But what it has done is it's sped up the grant program. So um, actually, we put in another 15. Then in the second part, we put another 40 in. So it's like whatever that adds up to in addition to 15 million, like $65 million or whatever it is. So everybody's on board now as a result of COVID. Um, there are – I favor independent companies. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I, I love at and I love CenturyLink. They're awesome companies. Uh, but what I have found in my experience is the most nimble companies tend to be smaller companies in whatever sector it is. So that's why we focused the, the great grant program to use that. Another thing we did, we've got, I think it's either 27 or 29 cooperative electric companies. Well, they manage the power on their grids going to different houses by – uh, fiber. Uh -huh. So they've already got dark fiber sitting there, but there was a law that prevented them from using it. So, uh, again, this was ARP and myself. Uh, we're we're kind of like the broadband gurus in the house. Uh, and Jason Sane is another one out in Lincoln County. Uh, we put a bill that um, it, it was only two paragraphs. Uh, no, that was, another, that was electric. This one was two pages, but it took a year to negotiate this. And what it allows co-ops to do is to set up independent companies wholly owned by the co-op so they can utilize the dark fiber and they can hire a company to provide service. So there are a couple co-ops in the initial stages of that because the co-ops are all in rural areas. Please. So long answer. But it, but you got another is, hot okay. button with me. Right. So. But you, you're right. Yeah. So I don't I don't actually don't want to belabor this point too long because yeah. the reason why I said I want to get into the the, the government aspect of this that's so. In order, let's say, for example, Cameron. We'll take uh, the area of Cameron, for example. Uh, they you, they have one or two options. They either have a DSL, and DSL runs over <coughs> phone lines because right. phone lines are clearly been set as a utility for God knows how long at this point, or satellite. So uh, let's just take this as a, let's say, more libertarian option that 
they have actually then uh, they petitioned, they've used their uh, HOA to petition Spectrum to come out there and do site surveys and you know do what they needed to to find out whether or not they can run a light out there. All right. Because the the technology of cable more or less involves some kind of central hub in order to actually make that work, and the closest one for them is really far away. So if they really want high speed internet, it's not uh, let's say DSL for example. With something, either something has to be created on the government end that is going to then, uh, let's say, uh, physically go out and set these boxes and lines up, or is something going to have to be put in place to f- either incentivize or force uh, these ISPs to then utilize their resources to physically put those boxes and lines up. That's that's really kind of the crux of the issue when I'm getting at. Let's see. If we do talk about like a Cameron, for example, mm-hmm. where they they're they're stuck between one of those two options, and we do want to get them high speed internet out there, and let's say Spectrum has nothing there. I know that for a fact. They have nothing <laughs> there. Your neighborhood? No. Okay. Um, if we want to get them, it, it, let's say hypothetically, so they actually even have an option. Um, my worry is that we are then going to turn one of those service providers into a PWC. And what I mean by that is that they're going to be a pseudo, uh, they're going to be a pseudo um, government, pseudo uh, public company, yet they're the exclusive um, only ISP that you can get in that area. With at least so, one pedophile on its board. Yeah, yeah. so someone's going <laughs> to... <laughs> Holy wow! So someone's gonna have to choose. Wow. So I heard PwC. I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard, heard PwC, PwC earlier. So I don't know. yeah, PwC. <laughs> so um, I get what you're going, and yeah. I've got the answer. I, I understand the problem, and I understand what you're saying is a potential solution that's already been tried, and it's not going to happen. It was tried in the town of Wilson and the tr- town of Salisbury, where we basically. Uh, I wasn't there at the time. It's like uh, I don't know, 2010, 11 where it allowed cities to put in infrastructure and provide services and things like that. And um, it's not making enough money to um, to do it. So both the town of Wilson and the town of Salisbury are looking for private providers to come in. So just allowing government to do things, like the analogy would be to let the, the town of Cameron do this. Right now they can't do that because we've tried that and we've seen that it doesn't work. And all it does is put the rest of the services the city has to offer, you know, whether it's water, sewer, garbage pickup roads, whatever, it puts all that stuff in jeopardy. So we've gone down a different road trying to incentivize um, municipalities, really counties, looking at it to get into public-private partnerships to do that because we're not going to, at least right now, we're not going to spend billions of dollars on connecting everybody with taxpayer money because it would take billions and billions of dollars to do it just in North Carolina. Then you have to maintain it and everything else. So if it doesn't generate enough revenue, I mean, there, there's this there's this revenue model on this that the major companies have. Smaller companies tend to have more flexibility to do things because they can, for areas where you don't lay uh, actual fiber, you might do Wi-Fi repeaters or or mm-hmm. something. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that people can do. Um, but the most nimble companies tend to be smaller in rural areas. Phone co-ops, if you go down to Bladen County, right below us, uh, south of us, their phone co-op has done fairly decent work on hooking up a lot of people. They don't have everybody hooked up because, once again, there's the adoption rate. You can offer it, but if people don't take it and if they don't pay, then how are you going to pay the bills to keep services coming there is no easy answer to getting uh, broadband to that neighborhood to the last single wide on the last dirt road in the most remote county there's no easy answer but what we've done so far we've seen what hasn't worked like wilson and salisbury uh we think we know what does work uh, and the great grant program has worked well so far uh, so we've continued to uh, plus up success if you will and the co-op thing there's a number of some co-ops don't want any part of it, but there are some co-ops that are really into it, and they're they're going down that road. Now that law just passed here in 2019, so there's there hasn't been enough time for actually people to to 
to do a lot more of that. But once the co-ops do that, then that opens up the avenue to get uh, smart thermostats that are actually Wi-Fi, um, little Wi-Fi things too. Yeah. And the USDA has grants that will help them pay for that. So, so it's a problem with no single solution. We're approaching it uh, from a number of different fronts. Uh, if there's something we haven't considered, uh, well, I took his name off, but uh, Representative Arp from Union County and myself and, we're all, and Sane from uh, Lincoln County, we're always looking for different ways to incentivize business to solve things. Mm. I, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. So it's I don't have to answer the question, but that's what we're trying to do. Okay. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Lovely jubbly. I, you no. guys well, are speechless. Is that? Is that what's going on here? It's like. Oh, oh believe man. me, I could, I could, I could make this one go. Yeah, yeah that or oh, we can, oh, oh, we can talk. Yeah. So that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's talk. That's um, something. Make sure we cover things. Uh, uh, you know, it's also. I want to get this man, miss your beauty sleep or nothing like that. <laughs> I got yeah, obviously I need all the beauty sleep I can get. So. We do want to we do want to mention hey 65 my friend, you're doing pretty good. Oh thanks. Uh, the I want to I, I do want to ask about ABC law just in general like you know in my experience with it selfishly even though this is political blackout. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, we do and we do want to touch on. I, I also guess, support the whites. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dream. Well, um, and then, we, you know, the cultural stuff, the racism and race and whatever stuff, I guess we want to touch on a little bit. Without go that, and that's something that I'd love to try to do that as, as innovatively as possible rather than beating the crap out of this. But it's like, it's, they're both interesting questions. So so do, do we want, so maybe we can, we can just have a chin wag, as we say at home about both of those topics and then you know we can maybe whatever closes it up you can take it from there uh, uh, but so pick your poison there representative uh, uh, flip a cap i don't care it, it, your and, show let's do what you want uh, well no it's this man's show uh, your that, show is that good looking do. sexy black man over there well i'm well considered nowadays i'm a sellout coon uh, <laughs> uh, I've, I've been learning what that means yeah uh, yeah. Well, I tell you what. Let's have a let's have a let's have a thing about talk about this race stuff, and maybe I can lead in not being a, a, an American uh, from birth. Um, uh, my little take on it, and we can go from there, and then maybe we can close on the wonderful subject of the Alcohol Beverage Commission. Well, that sounds uh, good. Yeah. All right. Uh, anyway, when I came here in '87, like a um, you know, I never actually. I was born in '84, by the way. 84. You were just a little pup. 1986. 86. The year before, uh, man. Before that. Yeah. <laughs> and that was back in your. What were you doing in 1987, John? You were in military. 1987. Man. Oh no, he was walking with Jesus back then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I just come down from the mount with Got Moses. Got a speed dial. The, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, um, you know, I remember Jimmy. Who you know, I'm and I, we, uh, Justin, Justin, our other friend, had gone <coughs> to Canada a few weeks before we left Dublin. He went to Canada to meet up with his uncle, and we all met in North Carolina. But Jimmy and I left Dublin together and flew to Atlanta. Never been to America before. 18 years old, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, you know. The heat, August 1st, mm. 1997, hot. Um, the limit we, we wanted to get outside of the airport even though we'd been warned don't leave the airport but we didn't listen mm. we didn't realize the airport was like a city you know Dublin airport's pretty small it's a little bigger now but, he, but back then it was like tiny but nothing compared to Atlanta the Hartsfield oh, or whatever huge. they call yeah. it now there's a train it's so big it has a train in it mm -hmm. it's amazing like we talk like America and go outside and the limos but I remember the first time and it's not this is okay to say but I, like we've never neither of us had ever like seen really really seen I suppose like a black man or woman before you know what I mean like a and America and and a, and a, or a and a, what you would think would be like a, a country person or a beach like, mm -hmm. like the things we'd seen on TV as children and growing up in in in, in Ireland about the United States particular kinds of people from certain parts of the country and all that it was fascinating you know and the Irish being kind of a, 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 a like a, 
you know, we weren't exactly uh, treated fantastically by the British. So you kind of had an automatic kindred spirit, you know. <laughs> for hundreds of years. Or yeah, yeah, thousands for, of years, for quite yeah, a while. Yeah. For quite a while. You kind of automatically had initially a kind of kindred spirit with, with, with the, uh, for want of a better way of putting it, like the, uh, the black struggle or, you know, the people who are kind of uh, occupy or appear to occupy, you know, the lower end of things and get, you know, have had to fight, you know, to get, to get recognition or get, get independence or whatever it may be. Our opinion on it. Since then, all these years later, a lot has happened. You see a lot, you know, and, and you know, when I see what's going on today in the country with, ra with the racism thing and all of that, you know, again, it, it's, it's a terrible thing because, y you know, nobody wants... Nobody wants to see anybody ever put down or, or marginalized because of something as ridiculous as their skin mm -hmm. color. Like, there's nothing you can do about it, you know what I mean? Uh, and, <coughs> however, I guess this country is still in a lot of pain because what you see happening is, is a large part of the argument is left out. Y you see a lot of black folks hurting other black folks, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? That is what I see, and pain in that community, and and uh, and it's it, you can't really talk about it, I suppose, or no one can really talk about it. So there's a lot of people that seems to me are very quiet right now, you know, kind of because it's very hard to talk, and it's very hard to 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 know what to say. You know what I mean? Ordinary, decent people who don't want to see anyone getting hurt, you know, because because of their skin or anything like that, and, uh, and they're gonna have to listen to insane arguments and unfair characterizations of situations and leaving whole sections of stories out like a like someone who's mm -hmm. you know who you know i know a lot of police officers you know uh, and they're human beings man they you know they're, they're ba there's some bad ones there's just lots of bad people but but generally speaking these people go home to it go home to you know a family you know and they're demonized and ripped you know and then i i don't know it, it seems to me like there's a lot there's a lot not getting spoke about um of what the actual truth of a particular situation is and how do you how do we talk about race i mean how do you is it, is it best to just kind of remain quiet and just kind of see what happens because no one can really talk for it even myself i find myself now examining my words before they come out of my mouth so I don't seem like an asshole. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, you're, you have white skin, so you're already an asshole. See what I mean? There we go. Just, it's terrible. I, you can't help it. You haven't even seen me wear my pants on. The the accent is not going to take away from your privilege, my friend. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> privilege. I came over two suitcases. But it, but anyway, I tell you what. Without, without, I think without without giving an, an opinion, because I think it's ridiculous to ask you or anyone to like say, well, tell me what you think. I mean, whatever you say, you're you're probably. But isn't it sad? And 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 and, 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 and what do we do? I mean, you're 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 in government with with people of of black people yeah, the people of absolutely. color you know i mean human beings just like you and i and everyone else and uh, what well, what are we to do well and what what do you see that, how do you guys get along and rally like i mean is, is there an obvious racial difference and and any and like kind of animosity maybe i'm just captain oblivious but i don't think there is i mean i haven't yeah, neither do I. I get, I get, um, yeah, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Bobby. Uh, uh, yeah, you're right. Thank you for that. Like, right, yeah, you know, yeah. but, but it's uh, no, I don't. Yeah, LT. I, <laughs> LT oblivious. I, I, I don't know what the real answer is. I, I'll tell you a short story I've never told in public before, but it's where I learn about racism. All right, I gotta go to the bathroom, guys. No, no, you'll do. <laughs> no, it'll be fine. Uh, I learned about it from my Hungarian grandparents who immigrated to this country in 1890s that we would, uh, I remember as a little boy, we'd go down to their house, they lived downtown Cleveland, my dad worked where my grandfather worked, and the, uh, the people who were the worst scum of the earth, that they absolutely hated them, uh, and they were racist, was gypsies. Mm. They, they, they worked with, with black people, they didn't care, <laughs> they worked with people from, I, I mean, they, they were the, <clears throat> And I would ask my mom, dad, when we leave their house. I mean, they they do the thumbnail with the tooth flick, whatever that means, and it's not good, you know. It's a, I, and it's like, 
what's the matter with the gypsy? What's a, first of all, what is a gypsy? And it's like, oh, a gypsy. Yeah, it's like, mm. and it just kind of showed me the stupidity <laughs> of classifying people. Well, I've kind of kept that with me my whole life. And, it, you know, when I went to grade school, I, mm. there were white kids, there were black kids. We didn't really have any Hispanic kids or um, any other. But, the, yeah, I mean, I, it just, I didn't, but gypsies, I, I stayed away from gypsies. I wouldn't even know one if I saw one. But it, right, it's, right. It, so it just shows how stupid to judge somebody by where they're from or the color of their skin or what religion. They, I mean, it just shows how stupid it really is. And it's, but but yeah. I can't. I, I mean, I don't even know why I'm telling the story. But it, it it's. I don't know how that helps us get past the divide of where we are today. I mean, I. Is there a divide? I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, is there is there? I ask myself, is there a divide? Most. People I know are fairly. One. They have a cre- yeah. one has been created, but I mean, but is is there really well, one? Artificially, if we're, if we're artificially. We're really, yeah. really honest about it. Ernest, what do you think? I mean, you're you're leading this, and I think uh, you but know. That because I'm black. Well, it, it, <laughs> oh yeah, some kind um, of we need some kind of equity. That, generally uh, speaking, at least finally a black person is leading something. Yeah, yeah. The answer to that would be yes, because apparently <laughs> you, you have to I, be. I can just see election goodbye now. Apparently, you have to be black to speak um, about certain things, and I think that. No, you know, no, you have to be black on the right side of the aisle because at the moment, <laughs> um, I no longer can claim blackness because I. I don't know. I don't tell the line uh, perfectly. But I I would say there's something unique that happened um, before Obama. Um, And I was looking at the uh, – and I I do this every now and again. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a geek. I do these things. Um, And I was looking at the – I was looking at a number of polls from Gallup uh, and others about race relations. And there's, there's, there's something that's really odd to me about the fact that one of the best times uh, polling wise for both black and white people that we had in terms of race relations was uh, right after Clinton and during Bush. One of the highest numbers they were in this for both groups. It was in like this. It was in the 70 percentiles. Okay. We're talking 71, 75 percentiles. And then we had such a, we had a very drastic drop. Um, There's a small spike um, under Obama, uh, and then there was this very fast, just almost like a climax of a movie chart. Like you were, you know, if I don't know if you remember when you were writing English stories, you had that, you, you, you did the story, you did this, you had the climax yeah. drop, and before like bottom off at the end, we had something very similar to that, mm-hmm. and that that seemed very odd to me, because I thought growing up. Uh, especially being born in D.C. and raised in Maryland, mm. constantly, constantly being told there's there's never one day they're going to let us be a president. They're never going to let us be in this position of power. They're never going to let us uh, hold those reins. Who's they, by the way? White people. White people? Even people like me from Ireland? Well, I mean... That's how insane black uh, black culture this, can be well, sometimes. This is new. Coming from you're, another place, I'm like, what, you're talking about me too? Well, some of us All are talking about people? new. I'm talking about in the past. Oh, all right. So they, they may not have included you then. They'll probably well, I'm include clu- you. I'm included well, now. Inclu- I'm sorry, you're included now. But but that's where they, they're, they're going <laughs> to lose, though. You're going to, like, no one... <laughs> No one's gonna care. You're being you know, unfair. Well, that's because they didn't hear your, they didn't hear your <laughs> accent. So I'm sorry to tell you that you're prejudged on that. I'm Irish. But I'm Irish. Uh, what I mean by that is that that I thought that after the election um, of Obama, I actually expected things to change a little bit because finally I, I'm talking about oh, my aunt's like your 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 grandmother, God rest her soul. You know she uh, was was waiting for this day her entire life. And by the way, my grandmother was a first for a lot of things in our area. First for a lot of things. We won't get into that. But uh, my family has roots in D.C. My mother was uh, on the first buses when they desegregated D.C. You know, there. I mean, we we've got this in the in the bag in terms of um, uh, oppression coming up out of that. So I there was an expectation that things are going to get better in terms of race relations, but surprisingly, it got worse. And very fast. Now we're at a place where it's probably worse now than ever has been before. Mm-hmm. That that I'm watching people, uh, other public figures, go into colleges and say, um, "Do you think do you think things are bad as n- now as they were back in the 1960s?" And people are like, "Yeah." Wow, that 
Now, me, a reasonable individual, I'm thinking back. I'm like, what? Are, are, are... Different drinking fountains and what? shit. What? <laughs> Lynchings. What? Wow, that's so really stupid. That's why half the time when I have the conversation about race relations, I feel like there's a there's there's another game being played. Mm. Mm-hmm. There's a completely another game being played. I think the, the the vast majority of the population are not playing to. Right, uh, it, and it feels that way. Which is why I, sometimes I don't like talking about it. Um, right, I bet it's painful. It's painful for everybody. It's painful for everybody, man. I, ordinary people, John. I, I think about people like you, and you know, no matter what, you know, you're here. To, you appreciate you being here and all, but you're, you're you're a human being. You know, you go home, you take your clothes off, you go to bed, you have family, people you love. I mean, maybe he doesn't take we, his clothes we, off. We know your dog. Uh, uh, <laughs> maybe know, he, maybe you're, he does. Your your kid is a friend of ours, and you know, and <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, you're a human being. You know, trying to do good and trying to do something worthwhile and trying to, you know, as we all are, and it's very sad for humanity and it's that this is going on and that there's so much so many lies being perpetrated and this, aggr- this insanity of b- burning things. What are you doing? It's insane. And they're, they're, and it's been supported and written about as a good thing. And what are you talking about, man? You know, I think it's making things incredibly worse. And it's, 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 it's seeding resentment. It's reinforcing stereotypes and resentments that are already there. I agree with you. Right? I, I, I don't know how to stop it. I think part of the problem is... What we're doing here and on TVs and internet, I mean, you can have instant news at your fingertips. It doesn't mean it's correct news or no. that it's truthful, yeah, it's so but you true. can have you can have any opinion that you subscribe to reinforced, uh, whether it's right or wrong, instantaneously. Right. It really and, is a matter of what I, what media I, you consume. Yeah, it's it's just. <laughs> Algorithms. It's, I, I, it's pretty it, depressing. It <laughs> well, it, Whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah please double. Yeah. Um, it, it's it is depressing, but it, it just makes me sad because we're we are capable of so much better than this. Yes, I we mean are. the United States is a is a country of immigrants. Of I mean, you came from Ireland. My grandparents came from Romania, Austria, and Hungary. I mean, Jewish I, guy. I, I, Jewish guy, you know, from all over the world, and what we have in common is the beliefs that all men are created equal. And I, I mean, decency. you know, I could go right down yeah. the you constitution. know the, the you Just know the decency, thing. Well, yeah, yeah, you, the thing. you know the thing. <laughs> yeah, you know the thing. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. Well, sadly, we used to have that. Well, we used to have but, that. But I mean, I still believe in that, I, and and maybe I'm just an old dumb white guy. But, but I still do believe in the founding principles. And right. I think that the founding fathers, while not perfect, set this country on a course mm-hmm. that distinguishes it from the rest of the world. That's exactly right. America is an no. idea. It, it is an idea. And not we just, all need to live into the idea and right. not go back into our tribes, just like my grandparents against mm-hmm. gypsies. It's true. It, it, that's as stupid as racism with blacks and whites is today. Yes. No. I mean, it's... It's probably dumber because you can't. I, anyway, <laughs> but but y- y- you know we're Americans first. The, the one thing I learned in the army was that everybody's green, and y'all bleed the same. Right. It, every, your blood's red, my blood's red, everybody's blood's red, and you're all green. And that was reinforced, and that was all before whatever you know classes we were forced to take. Right. But but that was just it, that was just a principle of being in the army. We all. We're all moving in the same direction. We're working for the same goals. I still believe that. Maybe I'm out of date. Maybe I'm dumb. But I, but I still yeah. absolutely believe that to the core of my being. Well, I wish he was here during that it. the woke conversation with the Smithsonian. Oh, we had a good conversation. The classification yeah. of the whiteness. Oh boy. Uh, they see the. Well, would I be like super white or what? Well, did you see the? Uh, there's a the Smithsonian. <laughs> Well, it was the what was the African the new Smithsonian Museum, the African American History and Culture Museum, put yeah. out a put out a chart. PSA and a chart. They put out a chart that outlined uh, white uh, culture, the, the definition of whiteness and white culture. the 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 biggest shocker was at the bottom of it had the Smithsonian logo on it. Smithsonian. So, so somebody had to approve this. Somebody had to see this and approve it, and it had. I mean, just outrage. They they eventually had to take it down because several people of color, namely black people, saw it. Color and, people? And, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Real, is there, um, is saw there it another and, kind? And, and, well, it got extremely offended. Like you know, several like a lot of black people saw it and got extremely offended because it defined whiteness as um, 
It has several characteristics like being on time. The idea of work <laughs> delayed ethic, gratification, delayed gratification, work now, you know, enjoy later. Maybe it's supposed to be um, a joke. So I the read it. flip of that was that if you weren't white, you didn't believe in it. That that, 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 that was the was? assumption. Well, it's, it's it's part of a bigger thing of of you know we spend the last several months uh, explaining why whiteness is bad, and now let's define it. And it was, I mean, it was it, the whole thing looked like a Marxist, That's bizarre, uh, you know, manifesto. But it uh, came the the, the biggest, the biggest shocker. Individualism was one yeah, of the indivi- things. Oh, uh, ownership, what? ownership of property was yes. one that was that was shocking. Um, trying to work explain. ethic, work ethic was was another one. I thought it was and, a joke. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was he a thought joke. it was a the joke. Nuclear family. The new, you know, but the, the Smithsonian had to pull it down because a lot of people got offended. Like not not white this people. This was the editorial process. It yeah. clearly this made it to the public eye before they took it down. It sounded like yeah. something Dave Chappelle wrote. That? I mean, that's just ridiculous. It yeah. was. Uh, and so yeah, we had a whole. We talked like two hours about this thing. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, it was. I mean, it's just a ridiculous thing. It's the whole idea of identity politics, um, critical race theory. But I mean, a lot of it was just. It was a Marxist manifesto. Um, let me. Of, can I say? I remember that conversation. But my take on it, John, because, you know, yeah. I think your take, my take when these guys were telling me this and they showed it to me, you know, I thought to myself, like, why are we even talking about, like, the people who believe this, of course, they, and their, their, their take was, it's the Smithsonian. It's the Smithsonian. The, the, the <laughs> people who believe this are they like. They had their logo stamped on it. We don't have anything much percent. higher than that. <laughs> like, as far as an authority, yeah. you would think. Don't you feel yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge silent majority out there? Who, oh, there is. Yeah. Like, like the, these things are getting talked about by some moron. And, and I, I honestly think that the majority of Americans, and I don't care if they're white, black, Hispanic, purple, green, maybe immigrant. Whatever. Are you sure. saying you don't see color? Actually, I am partially <laughs> colorblind. <so. laughs> He's talking, you got me there. But, but, I, but I really think that the majority of Americans reject all this yes socialist I, I so, so, so do too. i that, so do so i that oh. what they what they want is just the opportunity to have the best for themselves and their families mm-hmm. right. and fairness they, they just want just opportunity right. and mm-hmm. if it can be given fair they're fine with that because most americans i know <laughs> it's like just give me an even shot and i'll mm-hmm. work my ass off I, no. you know uh, well, you, do, do you do you listen we, to podcasts Generally, or, or no? You just kind of stay away from No. No, you don't? Okay. I was going to ask you <laughs> I that. might have to listen to this one. I was going to ask you who, 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 who you listen it's to. It's going to be good. Yeah. It's going to be good. Now, I'll tell you, before, before uh, let me say this, because it's after, t- now, me, I'm a night, I'm a night owl. No, these lads aren't. You've got, we're, we're, we don't, fine. we don't want to keep you too late. Yeah, uh, we, have a, game, we're, we have a game we're going to play with you at the end. Uh, yeah. We have a game I, we're going to play at the end before. I had, um. I mean, oh, I listen. Yeah. I listen to a lot of Dan Bongino. I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Bongino. I, I know who he is. Okay, yeah. He uh, he did an interview once with it was a liberal woman, um, African American woman, lived in California. I wish I could remember her name, um, but they they had a discussion about race, and this was about a month or two ago. Um, I mean, that's that's the whole point of them talking was about race, yeah. and uh, and one of her things was, I mean. She, uh, yeah, she was a Democrat, but uh, she didn't seem terribly liberal. Um, is that one of the biggest mistakes? He said that she one of her her biggest contentions was is that the Republicans right now of all times have a biggest have the biggest opening into the black community than they've ever had. But what's going to hold them back is um, kind of a, the history of of Republicans. They they think the best way to deal with race relations is just to say, well, I don't see color. Because we don't, I mean, honestly, I don't ever get around with my friends talking about being white. That's just, it's, it's not, it's, 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 it doesn't come up in conversation. Oh, I don't either. It, it doesn't come up in conversation. It's, it's unnatural to talk about. It feels weird. But the, what her point was is up. that, is that in, you know, a, a lot of times in the African American uh, community, that is a big part of their identity is being black. They okay. talk about being black. It's a big part of, you know, who they are, how they feel. And so if, if you have a Republican, so, you know, our way of thinking, you know, I, I don't go around talking about being white. It just doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. But a lot of black people, that is a, a large part of their identity is they t- they talk about being black and they that's a that's part of who they are. I don't think being white is part of who I am, but that's how the cultures are a little bit different. So what she was saying is what a lot of Republicans are missing out on is they say, well, I'm colorblind. 
I don't see race. And to, to, you know, when they're speaking to the black community, uh, you know, someone who's like, well, being black is a huge part of who I am. So when you say you don't see race, you're not seeing me. So it's so. Well, then, what, but her, 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 her shit sucks to be you. No, but her point was no. <laughs> she wasn't. She wasn't talking about what, herself. What do you want? She, she and that's why I always what? have to pay a cover when I walk in the patties. <laughs> no, but she wasn't talking about herself. She was just saying she was talking about the missed opportunity from Republicans. Is the, you know is they're approaching it from the point of view of well let's just not look at race. But she said but a lot of black people like race is a big part of who they are. So at least talk about it. Without the she, biggest political ad yeah, right now it, in this it, country, it, it's from that girl walking through Baltimore. Oh, oh yeah. Why, with, the, with the heels. The red dress and the heels. I know yeah, exactly what you're she, talking about. She, uh, it yeah. is <laughs> the literal biggest political ad yeah. in you mean the street, our country's history. The street with all the potholes. History. The street. So why do you think that is? One, I think She's it hot. gave. Okay, yeah, it's hot. I yeah, think it actually hot. gave a shock. I think it had some shock value to the who, rest of the who's, country. Whose seat is she running for? Like, what what seat is she running against? Um, uh, uh, jeez, uh, my brain farted. I'm pretty sure. Uh, what uh, he passed away. Oh, sorry, wrong button. That was the wrong button. That was wrong. Well, that's that's, that's passed away. That's when, when I mentioned the dress and the heels. We should have heard that one. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's. that's, that's yeah. yeah. Um, Damn. Was that Elijah Cummings just district? I, I, Maybe I don't know. I, I, so it's an open seat. I feel basically? like I yeah. I feel like that was a. Okay. Uh, it may have been, but well, one of the things this woman was talking about. Don't quote me on when, that. When, when her and Bongina were talking, were talking, she said, she said the only way we're going to be able to talk about race ever is if both, you know, both sides, or if if everyone can come to the table and agree, to, let's have a discussion as long as we agree that no one's going to get offended. Said so because we're you know we're going to ask dumb questions, we're going to ask offensive offensive questions, air quotes. Um, uh, you know, to each other. It, but as long as everyone can come together and agree, no matter what is asked or said, as long as we all agree, we're not going to get, again, dreaded air quotes, offended. That's the only way to to bridge that gap. And it's funny because that's the initial kind of conversation we had to start this in the first place. Yeah. Was that we need to get, at the very least, we need to get our ignorance out the way first. You need to be able yeah. to freely express those. It's true. You need, no, to, you're absolutely you need right. to feel yeah. safe to yep. be able to freely get those ideas out there. To ask the dumbest questions possible. And and have us, you know, because yeah. iron sharpened iron, as the good book says, but that is going to assume that iron's going, iron sharpened iron is going to make sparks. Mm -hmm. So we got to be able to get those sparks out the way first. But if we're not willing to even have, to have the conversation, like, look, we're going to sit down, we're going to have this conversation, and... I guarantee you I'm going to say things you don't like, and I, I can almost guarantee you're going to say things I don't like, but I'm going to not assume the worst of you as a human being to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. That has to happen first. That would be nice. Yeah. That has to happen first. So that's why the, when, when we started this, the three of us could sit around and be like, you know what? We're going to sit around. We're going to have a few drinks. We're going to sit at the house, unrecorded, by the way, <laughs> and we're just going yeah. to just – Say the things. We're gonna say whatever we want to, and we're not gonna hold it against each other, because we're, we we understand we're trying to come at as best as we can, as best as our knowledge provides us, the best truth we have to offer available. Then we can start hammering out those those lumps. Now we can actually have the conversation, but the nation is gonna have an issue with that because the nation has the media on the back end. To make those whatever that little hump was, whatever that speed bump was, they're gonna turn that thing into Mount Everest. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. Because what it takes to have a conversation is to actually take the time to have a conversation. It's not a, a, a sound bite about a conversation about you said this out of context and I said this out of context, and all of a sudden uh, everybody's up in arms because you said this and we got in a fight. We didn't so get in a fight. We had a conversation. The media are it, so to blame it, for it, that. Well, what, yeah, they are. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah. But, yeah. but they just yeah. are because the media is run by ratings, is run by how many people buy ads, but that's not and new. it's run by money. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and everyone remember the main. Yeah, and lefties. It's remember, the, lefties, remember right? the main start of the Spanish American War. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, oh yeah. That was, I mean, that was media driven. Who can and, sell the most newspapers? We, we still don't know war. to this day who blew it up. I think we do. do I, we? I heard I was uh, in a history yeah, class, okay. and it was um, 
because the Maine was one of the first ships that had uh, mostly metal construction. Uh-huh. It, I mean, back you know back in the day, ships were made out of wood. Yeah, yeah, the Maine yeah. had metal construction, and they had stored some munitions in a room like adjacent to the the engine room, and so the wall got hot. The metal wall got hot, set off the munitions. The munitions. Uh, the Maine blew it from the inside. Ah, so yeah. it wasn't a Spanish torpedo. They figured this out in like the 90s or something when they went down and they saw the actually saw the main underwater <clears throat> and the explosion came, you know, came out instead of went in. I, I didn't All right, well, know. Now, now that we got that fantastic yeah. <laughs> history <laughs> lesson. You know no, but it was good. but the media I drove like the media drove the Spanish sunker ship, the Spanish sunker ship ah. and uh cuz it was a ratings war between Hearst and I think it's about time so, to play the game. Pulitzer somewhere. Is around, is I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. I just want to say that there are going to be people making love to that section of this podcast. That was what? <laughs> what you just said there. Oh, yeah, that's the, how, the history lesson. That's well, how yeah. stimulating that was. My, that was very his stimulating. Was so close up on the mic. This time we actually got to hear his <laughs> sultry voice. Very close. All right, play the game. All right. Let's do something so, fun before we just well, fall I, I had a little bit of a word association. Before, you know, I say a word, you just say the first thing that comes to mind. Is All right. Is that agreeable or... So the rest That's of the world, just, it's bad. I, don't say well, it, John. Okay, so don't I say, it. say it. You, you no, you say it. You say it. Yeah. Right, don't so fall before, for this Before one. we get into this, I want to I want to let everyone know that it's, it's nothing. It's all I just wrote. We it have about five we have ago, imbibed a little bit at the beginning of this uh, outset, been, yeah. and we made sure that Mr. Soga, uh, Mr. Soga has been drinking. Uh, I mean, yeah. representative of what is it, the forty fifth district, forty fifth district of North Carolina since twenty twelve has been drinking water on top of his uh, imbibing, so he might be a little he, more... Uh, he had a total of, like, four ounces of beer. Well, uh, non alcoholic <laughs> beer. I made sure to keep refilling, which, by the way, he doesn't touch that next one, which no, is scary. No, he does not, yeah. Um, so just uh, let that be known, because this is how we have fun here. It's, no, so, it's, uh, it's well, The whole thing's... The whole night's been fun, so I... Well, cool. Okay. And it was some more fun, so... All right. No, it's, I mean, I didn't go... I could have gone, like... Way worse. So I, we, I we, are, we, are, we, we are going to call just, you on this because this is going to be a word association game. So you're, you're not going to be able to spin, you know, right, yeah. let me focus. your yeah, political, focus. your political jargon, your canned answers. This so when, oh, the, when the I word is thrown answer. out there, we want an immediate <laughs> response. Okay. No, I, again, I, I could have. Yeah. Ne- or maybe our next guest. We'll just go like into left field. But this one's pretty good. Um, our right, word association government sucks. All right. There we go. All right. Cool. CNN sucks. 2020 election. Uh, is that a word? Oh, belaboring. <laughs> yeah, oh, whatever. Yeah. What like, you got? Oh, man. The first thought that comes to my 2020 election. Belaboring. What's your, uh, yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> what, you, what comes to okay. mind? 2020 I'll say election. something, but just stop him humming. Um, <laughs> 2020 election, complicated. Complicated. Yeah. All right. Uh, favorite actor? Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. All right. Uh, Donald Trump. Awesome. Awesome. There we go. Uh, baseball. Not my sport. Not your sport. Democrats. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> John. Me, that was not me. John. Just so everybody knows. Um, just kidding. Misguided. Yeah. Misguided? All right. Raleigh. Nice town. Nice town? Okay. Fox News. Uh, mostly good. Mostly good. Um, all, right, all right. Best anchor on Fox News. Ooh. I just added this one in there. I don't know. This wasn't on my list. Um, I've got at least five. They're all women. I, well, I, I, I don't know if there's a best anchor, but I, I enjoy the five the most. And the I five. don't care who's okay. on. Greg cool. Gutfield's the five. my guy. The well, five. Yeah. All right, cool. Favorite musician slash band. Favorite musician slash Yeah, or band. band. Yeah. John Cook and Milligan. No. Let the man answer, for God's sake. Um, I'm almost afraid to say this because, I mean, you right, go. My, uh, Katy Perry. Katie, oh, there wow, you go. I like there this man. I'm voting for this man. I did not see that there coming. There we go. All right, I did not see that coming. I like the her snippet. too. Dude, it's and not my generation, but yeah. she's, I, you know, anyway. She's Joe Biden would agree. Next. There we go. Oh, um, dude. I, you <laughs> have so <laughs> There you go. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay, go. Um. <laughs> how about uh, football? Um, Cleveland Browns. Cleveland uh, Browns. Kind, what Browns. kind of football? Okay, uh, what about uh, European this football? Kind? Soccer. Soccer. You're, you're this football. Kind. You have to go with Liverpool. Yeah. Liverpool! Hey! Yeah. Champion! Champion! <laughs> uh, champions of Europe. Uh, yeah, well, not anymore. Bayern Munich, yeah. <laughs> champions of England, champions of the world. Um, North Carolina. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. 
All right, that's all I got. Anybody else? Thank I God. Oh. I didn't know where else go. I was going to go. So yeah, no. I, I, <laughs> again, that was, that was easy. That was a good one. Guys, what? I don't know. What? That was easy. As long as you don't play this before <laughs> November 3rd, I'm probably okay. But. All right, well, I'm sorry to tell you it probably was going to go quite a bit before then. It is only 9 24 2020. So, guys, this has been an absolutely amazing night. One of the best we have actually had. Before you uh, close I mean, out, I can I just care. say no, that was good thank stuff. you, John? Good, good stuff, look. Yeah. Thank you. Good guys. look. Good. I think you're <clears throat> fabulous. It's great to meet you. And uh, I, uh, I wish you well. I want you to tell you I'll be voting for you. And I say that to you, not to kiss your arse. I just think that you're genuine. You, you're genuine and good for you. And yeah. thank you for what you're doing for the oh. rest of us. God bless. And everybody, ladies and gentlemen, we are finally closing out what is one of the best segments we have ever had on Political Blackout. We have Patty Gibney, our residential Irishman. How are we doing this evening, Patty? Who Everyone's has no more questions? Yeah, do you, when you ask me something like that, Ernest, do you really want to know how I'm doing or are you just full of shite? Hey, it's actually going on <laughs> to the next white person. Completely full of shit. Mamosh Samson. And our special guest this evening, representative of 45 NC, John Soka. I'm not sure I like the way you announced that, but thank you for having me here and I appreciate it.